Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. Shut up and grind some tape. What is up, my beautiful people? Happy Monday to you. Welcome into the Film Guy Network. We got a loaded week of shows for you guys planned for this wonderful, wonderful week of the quote unquote off season of college football. Boy, there are a bunch of different titanic plates moving and shifting and collide with one another in the world of college football, and we'll be talking about it tonight. We need to talk. That was the text message we talked about last week to close the week, right? The we need to talk text. Everyone's gotten one at some point in their life with any type of relationship, and it's never a good text, right? The we need to talk text or quote the, hey, there's a team meeting in 10 minutes. That message never goes well for anybody, for any uh, you know man in a relationship, any football player in a football program getting the, hey, sudden team meeting text message in a matter of 20 minutes. Last week, we talked about the rare occasion where that text message went well for a lot of people, right? In Eugene, Oregon last week, a bunch of players got that dreaded text message only to find out that their head football coach was sticking around at Oregon, right? Dan Lanning, hey, I'm not leaving. The grass sure is green here in Eugene. And that was a great story, and that's yes, a tremendous story. And we, we alluded praise towards that, talked about the machine that Dan Lanning might potentially be building out there at Eugene, especially considering he turned down Alabama to do so, right? But we talked about how 99.9% of the time, those text messages don't go well. They don't go well for the recipient of those text messages. And two primary examples of this not going well for those individuals' uh, types of text messages happened at Washington and Arizona this past weekend, right? Washington football players got that team meeting text message in 20 minutes, and they found out that their head football coach was leaving them. Arizona got that same text message from Jed Fish, and they found out he was leaving. Now, those two individuals, by all accounts, right, Kalen DeBoer and Jed Fish, by all accounts, are tremendous humans. They are very genuine human beings. Prior to this past weekend, you would have not heard a single cross word about either of those individuals from anybody in the public limelight ever. In fact, they were like two of the hottest candidates in college football, as we've seen happen, right? They were very, very popular. They had a very, very high Q rating, right? High PR rating. Now, these guys leave their, their, their beloved schools, right? They go on to take better opportunities, which by the way, that's kind of what coaches do. Coaches are out here constantly moving in search of better opportunities, all right? They're constantly bebopping around trying to get some type of promotion. There is no loyalty in the world of college football coaching, just like there's no loyalty in the world of college football in general, just like, by the way, there's no loyalty in your day-to-day life. If better opportunities present themselves, you're going to explore them, and nine times out of ten, if they're that much better, you're going to exercise those opportunities, right? You're going to go after those opportunities. So I don't think there's any shame in leaving a job ever. I don't think there's ever any shame or should be any shame in the leaving, the choosing to leave for a better opportunity if you're so, if your heart so says so, right? But there is definitely shame in exiting. There's always going to be shame in exiting. Every time you leave something like this with a halt exit, you're going to receive some type of backlash like we've seen with Kalen DeBoer and Jed Fish. Players going on social media, you sent one into the chat the other day of guys talking about how the message put out on social media from Jed Fish was longer and took longer to read than the actual team meeting that he had with his players, right? We've seen Kalen DeBoer get absolutely torched by Washington football players and Washington fan bases and Washington uh, alum, right? About how, hey, what, what's up with all this loyalty? And boom, you turn around and leave us the moment uh, brighter pastures present themselves. There is never, ever, ever going to be a coach leave his Power 5 opportunity for another Power 5 opportunity and have everybody pat him on the back and say, hey, coach, we wish you the best of luck. In fact, I present to you guys here today and to you in the chat, find me. Find me the one singular example of a football coach leaving a Power 5 school and going to another Power 5 school and it just being just awarded with loads and loads of praise. I, I don't know of one. I really don't. I see all the time the mid-major coach going to the Power 5 level and everybody happy for that guy, right? Everybody happy for that guy. 
But the guy making six million dollars at Arizona, leaving Arizona to go make nine and a half million dollars in Washington, ain't nobody applauding that one. They think that lacks loyalty. Am I am I correct here? There's no proper way to do this breakup, guys. Everyone's going to be hurt on this one. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I could even think of, and I can't off the top of my head think of one where it's happened is the guy goes to his alma mater per se where he's a head coach Correct. here and then he goes to his alma mater where it's kind of like okay that makes sense but other than that it's it's really not because college football is one of the weird sports as well where you're actively focusing on next season while you're in the middle of one season like you have to do recruiting you have to tell people yeah i am going to be here next year to only turn around and then leave the only one where i could maybe think went well was when james franklin went from vandy to penn mm, state because at that one. point vandy fans were probably just grateful for the fact that they were relevant for once yeah. in football and so they were more just grateful for what franklin did and they knew like at some point we're not gonna be able to hold on to this guy because that's not what we do at vanderbilt like that's not how we're built so that's the only instance where i could think of maybe both sides were like oh great you know like we got some good memories to hold on to now and now penn state maybe has something to look forward to and not to throw any shade but that is very akin to mid-major to power five. Yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah. Like that that is very much so, hey, coach, you gotta do this. No different than and this is a different example, okay, but it's very similar. Dan Mullen leaving Mississippi State to go to Florida. It was kind of like, coach, you gotta do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Whereas like I think if Drink would have left Missouri to take an Alabama job, he probably would have got some smoke from Missouri for fans. For sure. Yeah, right? absolutely. For sure. Yeah, that, that would have been a very, very similar transaction to what's happened right now out there out west, right? That would be that would be very similar, right? Uh, an Arizona coach leaving for Washington is very akin to a Missouri coach leaving for an Alabama job. This one's kind of, I don't know if it counts, but Urban Meyer to Ohio State. I know there was some mm -hmm. time in between. There but... was some faking of a heart attack and some heart issues, yeah. yeah. I think you almost need it to be like. I'm what? sorry, Urban. <laughs> if, you, if you actually had a heart attack, I apologize. Cardiac arrest, no, no joke. Uh, but neither is hiding murder. I think you really need the situation to, <laughs> to be. Geez. I think you need the situation to be like the fan base. One, the fan base is ready for the coach to leave, and the other fan base is just ready for a new coach to be coming in. Like yeah. that way, there's you know, I don't know, gratitude on both sides. Mark Rick to Miami might be, but he didn't leave. He yeah, was he fired. fired. Yeah. So. Again, there's not. There yeah. is no good example of power five coach leaving power five job to go to another power five job and not getting cooked by his, uh, his team and his fan base. Hmm. All right. yeah. Welcome in. We got a loaded show for you guys tonight. We're going to be talking about how Kalen DeBoer out there at Alabama, though he may not be from the Saban coaching tree, he is definitely going to be under the shadow of that massive coaching tree out there in Tuscaloosa. What is Alabama going to be doing at defensive coordinator? A uh, lot of stories going on right now with Travaris Robinson. We're going to give you the lowdown on what we know and what transpired with that uh, whole ordeal. I know Georgia fans are going out there trying to dunk on Bama fans, and you might have one or, or a good reason to do so today. We're going to talk about that. Dominoes continue to fall uh, from the fallout from Nick Saban's exit from the world of college football. Does the, We talked a little bit about this Jed Fish decision decision earlier or just a second ago does it actually make sense both from Jed Miss or Jed Fish's standpoint and uh Washington's standpoint as well JJ McCarthy headed to the NFL we'll talk a little bit about that as is his potential head coach and Jim Harbaugh just wrapped up an interview out there with the Los Angeles Chargers and Cam Ward has spurned the NFL to take his talents to South Beach that's right Miami has their transfer quarterback despite the fact that he has announced or didn't announce at one point that he was going to be going to the NFL draft. Uh, we also have pick three tonight, which I will give you the three categories here in just a second after I take a minute to show some love to our friends over at Prize Picks. Run over to Prize Picks today. Use promo code Brooks. You'll get a hundred percent deposit match as the NFL playoffs continue to ramp up, as NFL or NBA playoff or NBA season starts to continue to ramp up. All right, there are plenty of action. There is plenty of action, I should say over on prize picks and you will get 100% deposit match if you are a new user today using promo code brooks just run over there sign up you'll get up to $100 you put up to $100 in you'll get matched instantly with that free hundo in your account so use promo code brooks go to prizepicks.com today and show some love all right gentlemen do you want to know what the categories of pick three are today i'd love to we Even have to football weather we have vicus and we have Peacock. So we're going to go ahead and top off the give them three section right now of those three categories. Which would you rather me rant about first? I want to hear football weather. You want to hear football weather? So this isn't really a rant. It's more of a proposition to the room. Um, what is ideal football weather? Okay, see, I, I'm a Southeasterner. I do love a good snow game. I think everyone loves a good snow game. But I think there's a fine line between this is dumb shit. That's not football. They're just running around on a block of ice. And ooh, snow game. 
Snow game, fun. Running around, block of ice, everybody miserable, not fun. Okay, so I think there is a fine line of football weather, and I think we saw that fine line this past weekend where, hey, look, snowstorms are cool. Icicles in the beards, not so much. Let's get away from that. <laughs> I think it's like – if you're going to be cold and you're going to go play football in the cold, it better be snowing. Like it, it, when I think about actively me, snowing, when I think of me as a kid, like if my buddies were like, Hey, it's 18 degrees outside. You want to go play football? I'd have been like, heck no. But if it's, Hey, it's 18 degrees outside and there's snow on the ground, it's snowing like, Oh yeah, of course we want to go outside and play mm -hmm. football. So if it's actively snowing, then I'm cool with it. But if it's just freaking cold, s screw that, man. I think one snow game per se like that, like we saw with Buffalo and Pittsburgh or even mm -hmm. Kansas City and Miami, that one of those a season is perfect, but any more than that, I don't consider that football weather. Yeah, I thought the 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 Patriots Raiders, the tuck rule game, oh, yeah. that yeah. that was a snow game, man. I'm talking yeah. about a foot of the shit. I'm, yeah. I want to see some <laughs> snow angels out there, dog. Uh, I want to see like twelve, or like a full inch stud spikes on the cleats. Um, I want to see that kind of stuff. I want to see somebody disappear into the snow when they when they get tackled. Um, not just frozen weather, but ideal football weather. Like if I, I'm talking about prime time, like ooh man, I could play some ball today. Um, about 56 degrees right mm -hmm. as the time changes, but not before the time changes. Right as the time changes, like that week before, yep. where it's like 6:30 and it's starting to get dark. Got a little bit of nip in the air. All right, just starting to see the breath. Okay, not like. Oh, dude's blowing out smoke, but just like, oh, like you really got to force it to get a little fog. That's ideal football weather right there. It's Over, overcast with a nice little breeze. Mm, talk to me now. It's the weather that when you first step out the door and you're like, ooh, like this, this feels like football weather. Like yeah. that's, that's the perfect degree it needs to be like when you're finally getting, I call it hybrid weather. You know, mm. it's not too cold, not too hot, just kind of creeping into fall, but maybe you don't classify it as fall. Like that type of weather right there. That's the perfect weather. I love it. Um, all right. Let's talk about this not under the tree, but under the shadow discussion right here. Okay. Nick Saban's coaching tree is obviously vast. We all understand this, right? Very big. There are dozens, dozens and dozens of coaches all across from Dean Pease to Dagum, Dan Lanning, all right, that are quote unquote Saban disciples, all right, guys that would coach underneath this tree. And they obviously went outside of this tree to do this hiring, but I just want to read some names, right? Kirby Smart, Mario Cristobal, Lane Kiffin, Steve Sarkeesian, Mike Loxley, Dan Lanning. Those were all names. And granted, a lot of those weren't available, right? Like Steve Sarkeesian, we already talked about, probably not available, right? Kirby Smart, definitely not available. Dan Lanning obviously said no. But there were some other options that if they wanted to keep things copacetic, if they wanted to keep things Saban-esque, if they wanted to keep things in the mold in which they were built, right, and not stray from the tree, they would have hired somebody within this name or within this tree, I believe, right? If they wanted someone to run it with the pure and, and the same guts, right? And maybe some even some oversight from Nick Saban, I truly believe they would have picked from this tree, right? But even though they didn't pick from this tree, obviously they went way out west. They hired Kalen DeBoer, a quote-unquote outsider, and everybody in front of a microphone has done the, ooh, he going to have to learn to recruit. We all understand that. That's, that's all to be, you know, that's an easy stance and an easy take to make. That's an obvious one. The question to me is, if they went outside the tree, are they going to allow this guy to work outside of the shadow? What do I mean by that? Well, Nick Saban obviously was going to cast a massive shadow. He has the biggest legacy of any college football coach of all time. He's the greatest of all time. We all know this. So the expectations that DeBoer were going to have to meet uh, were going to cast a massive shadow anyways. The shadow I'm talking about is the old NFL version of a meddlesome owner's uh, you know, shadow, right? The owner that might be a little bit too involved or the guy of the previous regime that's still trying to stick around. Now, this is the greatest football coach of all time. We all know this. But they went outside the tree. Okay, They did not hire a mini-me. They hired somebody totally different with the approval of the GOAT. Now, is the GOAT going to just walk off into the sunset, go do TV, or is the GOAT going to stick around and help with decisions? That, that's kind of my question here. And if the GOAT, if Nick Saban sticks around and is not just around, like he's got an office in the building and he comes by every once in a while, but if he's like around around, like if he's like giving input on decisions, that seems very, very counterproductive. They should have just gone out and hired, you know, somebody within the tree. Because if he's going to be there, why not get someone like-minded? Guys, am I thinking too much about this? Or is it, you know, is it a possibility that we might have like a, and granted, he's the greatest of all time. 
is there any chance that he might become meddlesome here and not allow DeBoer to like do DeBoer things? And here's what made me think about this. That press conference was weird. The press conference was weird to me where we got this brand new head coach who's got all these expectations to live up to and the daggum tree in the shadow that he is cast upon or underneath is sitting right in the front row the entire time. It was, it was just – it's a very difficult situation, and I don't know if, if Saban's doing a good enough job of saying, I'm, I'm out. Like, hey, your show, you got all my approval in the world. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be something that'll get better over time. Like Saban has to get a cut. I mean, he's barely a week into this of being disconnected from Alabama football and being disconnected from football as a coach. So I'm sure that this relationship, if it continues to be like this one-on-one -on -one type of mentor type thing, maybe I'm sure it'll get better over time. But it certainly has to feel awkward if you're DeBoer because, I mean, nobody wants to be like – constantly followed by the guy that they're trying to live mm -hmm. up to and trying to take over for like you kind of just want to ISO I mean anytime a new coach of any sport comes in typical what they do I mean they clean house entirely typically they don't want any type of lingering um, connections from the previous re regime link staying around I definitely see the negative sides of it where it is is Nick Saban going to be the guy that stays around too long and, and negatively affects you as a coach because you can't ever have an original idea but I mean you also, at the same point, you have the goat of college football on your side now, like mm. consistently helping you, consistently giving you pointers, consistently giving you tips, game plans. Hey, when we played this guy, this worked a lot for us. I mean, yeah. you're talking about a guy that coached at Washington. He's not going to be seeing – he hasn't seen a Kirby Smart. He hasn't seen Drinkowitz, all these other guys in the NFL or SEC yeah. that are really good coaches. So, I mean, I think it's kind of a give and take. It just depends on how involved Saban is. If he's overseeing to the point where Ken DeBoer can't be himself, that's going to be the issue. I think the fine line is uh, advice versus input, right? If I'm calling you, that is advice. If I'm saying, hey, I need help, give me advice, that's one thing. If you're calling me and giving me ideas, that's input. Those are two different types of meddlesome, right? One is being asked for, the other be is being given. Um, so I, I, again, this is the greatest of all time. If he wants to do what he wants to do, he's going to do what he wants to yeah. do. You're not going to tell him to get out of your office. Yeah. No. Um, but then again, I, I also don't know if there's anything that's going to be negative or like bad for your program that Nick Saban ever suggests, unless it's just counterproductive. It's why the whole under the tree versus in the tree discussion was, was pertinent to me because this guy, whether or not he's going to bend to the ideals or agree to the ideals that Saban might present or the, the required traits to win in the SEC or whatever, that's not who this guy is, right? This is, a, this is his style. He's coming out from his way out west and going to bring it here. And what if you're making someone do something that they're not accustomed to do, are you going to directly impact the success that they had doing it their way? Right. If I wrote right handed my whole life and I got great penmanship and the whole company writes left handed, eventually I'll get good at writing left handed if I got great penmanship, but it might not come naturally. Right. And I'm not saying they're making him right left handed. I'm just saying you got to be careful of hiring this outsider, quote unquote outsider, who's great, by the way. He's elite. OK, but if you make that outsider who's elite at doing outsider things, if you make him fit into this square box that is your, you know, whatever, you might inhibit him. You might keep him from reaching his ultimate successes. Yeah, I mean, too, as a head coach, or I mean, as anyone in general, I think everybody wants advice. Everybody wants some input from other people of how they can do better. But at some point, you want that success to be under your own umbrella. I don't think DeBoer at any point wants it to be oh, well, he won 12 games this year at Alabama because Nick Saban was just kind of helping him still guide the ship around. I, don't, I mean, he doesn't – I don't want to speak for him necessarily, but I would have envisioned to say that if you take the Alabama job, if you are DeBoer and you make the cross-country trek to go all the way to Alabama, I would think that you want that success that comes along with being Alabama to be your own. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be as big of an issue. I mean, obviously, worst-case scenario is – Nick Saban's a control freak. He doesn't let Kalen DeBoer do anything he really wants to, but Nick Saban's so hands-off that the team never really succeeds. But I think it's more going to be a, a mutual relationship where Nick Saban gets to do just enough to where he doesn't feel like he's sitting on his ass for the rest of his life. Yeah. And Kalen DeBoer is also getting tips from the GOAT on to how to run a program. I think that's – it's. I'm leaning more towards what that's it's going to be. All right, so I'm about to blow up the show notes um, because everybody's in the chat's already asking about it. I was going to do a lot of the, the Travaris Robinson storylines in the local hour, um, but we got a bunch of people here, so we're going to go ahead and attack it. So let's talk about this today. Um, all right, here's the timeline, right? 
Saturday, Travaris Robinson announces that he is going to take the defensive back and co-DC job at the University of Georgia. Will Muschamp going to step down in an off-field analyst role, okay? Travaris Robinson going to be that DB coach slash co-DC. Now, what that spurred was uh, Kalen DeBoer to get on the phone and basically offer Travaris an opportunity to come interview for the defensive coordinator's job at Alabama. I'm under the impression that Travaris during this time never actually had a chance to move out of Tuscaloosa. I'm sure he was still there during all of this process. So here's how this happened. He goes to that interview process and something went astray. All right. Something went wrong and they didn't end up coming to agreements. Here's what I am hypothesizing went wrong. All right. I think Alabama told Travaris Robinson, we will give you the role of defensive coordinator and then we will basically dictate what kind of defense you're going to play. All right. Because I don't know if y'all know this, but Kalen DeBoer has had the same defensive coordinator travel with him for the last 16 years. Is that what you told me? Something like that. So like decade and a half of this dude traveling and going everywhere DeBoer's gone and then being in unison. Same thing, by the way, with Grubb. Not that extent, but the offensive coordinator has been with DeBoer for a very, very long time as well. So you might ask yourself, why, A, would Travaris Robinson agree to such a title? And B, why, why would Alabama be so adamant about keeping Travaris Robinson and just throwing a title at him and giving him additional money if that were indeed the case? Which I, by the way, 100% adhere to this belief because here's the deal. Read the tea leaves on Travaris Robinson's last four years. What's this guy been doing? Travaris Robinson's been going from Power 5 school, national title contender, to national title contender, trying to get promoted back to a defensive coordinator's role in the SEC where he last held under Will Muschamp at South Carolina. Okay, so this guy is very obviously in search of a promotion and in search of getting back to the pinnacle of his job title, which is defensive coordinator. I don't know whether or not he's got aspirations to be a head coach anytime soon or anytime in the rest of his career, but I do know sure as shit, he's been trying to get back to a defensive coordinator's role. So he is going to take that phone call, which per my sourcing is exactly what Kirby Smart and Will Muschamp, who by the way, Will Muschamp, Chavaris Robinson is like best coaching friend. They're like dudes. They are like associates. They are homies, okay? So when the phone call gets on Travaris Robinson's phone that says, hey, they want to interview me now for the defensive coordinator job, he picked up the phone to his now new employer and said, hey, what do you guys think I should do? And Kirby and Muschamp said, well, duh, you got to go take the interview. Like, we're not going to tell you to turn that down. Like, that's what you, it's where your whole aspirations are. It's what you want to do. We know this, you know this. So go take the interview. Now, why wouldn't he take that job if that were actually the job being offered? Well, maybe because that was not the job I, that was actually being offered, which is what I just laid out in front of you, right? I don't think that it was anything other than a title and a bump in pay. So why would they offer him a title and a bump in pay and still know all the while that they're probably going to run their own type of system dependent or interdependent upon the hiring of or the maintaining of Travis Robinson? Well, well, you keep T-Rob, you might be able to keep some of these really great players that he's brought to Alabama, right? That was probably the game plan from Alabama. So I know a lot of uh, Georgia fans in the mentions, and I know a lot of Georgia fans in the comments, and a lot of Georgia fans on social media probably did the, <laughs> look at Kirby dunking on Kendall DeBoer. Dude only been here five days, and we got a uh, co-DC instead of their DC, right? Y'all want to do the whole thing. I don't think they're 100% mutually connected. I personally think this was a title thing in hopes of maintaining a little guy by the name of, not a little guy, a guy by the name of Caleb Downs. So it sounds like to me that this was more so a, maybe not a Kirby Smart play, but a Will Muschamp type thing because, I mean, they go back to 06 at Auburn. Mm -hmm. And when um, Tavares was a grad assistant and Muschamp was a DC there. So do you, is that true? Like it was more so like because Will Muschamp's at Georgia, that's probably why Robinson is at Georgia? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think Will Musch I think Will Muschamp wanted to step away from a little bit into an off the field role because he's probably a little burnt out. And by the way, he's been I looked it up yesterday. Will Muschamp has been a defensive coordinator or a head coach in the SEC since two thousand and four. Jeez, wow, what a run! So money probably ain't a problem for Will Muschamp, and there's probably a burnout factor there. I would imagine, and right? His, so. Um I, I don't what I, I that is true that can be true while also saying I don't think he takes this step down for anybody other than T Rob. Mm -hmm. 
I think they made this. I think Will Muschamp was like, yeah, we need to do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? For the mm-hmm. betterment of the University of Georgia and for my lifespan. Yeah. Jeez. And I, I think the reason Alabama so so desperately went, not I don't want to say desperately, but went after uh, Robinson was because not only is it very important in maintaining the roster that you had from 2023, but also moving forward. Kalen DeBoer mm-hmm. and his staff probably aren't going to have a lot of ties to the South. No. And Travaris Robinson is an excellent recruiter in the South. So I think that's probably another key factor as to why they were like, we have to do everything we can to retain this guy. And look, man, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a negative. I'm not saying this is something to point to and go, ooh, hey, that's a bad sign for the DeBoer regime at, at, at Alabama. But the whole analysis of this guy coming to the Southeast was that he was going to have to kind of not morph, but he's going to have to learn the ways down here, right? And part of that is being willing to bend, right? Being able to meet people in the middle, mm-hmm. being able to willing to, to come to a conclusion and it not always be you 100% winning those conclusions. This is a prime example of this, in my opinion, right? Like if Travaris Robinson wanted to call plays and it drastically or at least slightly impacted your chances of keeping Caleb Downs, let him call plays, right? Like if, if that's going to be – and I'm not saying that's it, right? But I do think if Travaris Robinson is the defensive coordinator in Alabama, we don't hear so much staggum smoke about Caleb Downs contemplating or wavering or whatever with regards to the portal. We're going to get into the Downs stuff here in just a second. But, guys, if if the – it's not even just Caleb. It's Des Ricks. It's, it's the other corners that he signed. It's the guys in the 2025 class. It's the signees in the 2024 class. It's, it's the retention of all of these athletes – um, and all you have to do is just be willing to let a very qualified defensive coordinator be your defensive coordinator. And again, I'm not saying it's a miss. I'm just saying it's the first sign of an unwillingness to bend, mm. in my opinion. <clears throat> mm-hmm. What if? But what if like the recruiting doesn't matter all that much? What? If, what? And he, here's here's why I say that because I think if one, if there's one thing that you could take away from 2024 is that we had two teams that do not did not recruit in the top 10 top 15 even for the most part compete for a national title so if what if DeBoer can just go to Alabama and maybe he's not consistently great like they were under Nick Saban maybe they're not competing for national titles on a year-to-year basis but maybe every three years every four years you do compile that roster through a combination of the transfer portal and the guys that you've developed for the last few years and you do compete for national title maybe that does become maybe the new standard under DeBoer so maybe he doesn't have to continue this top five recruiting that Alabama has done for the last 20 years you know we talked about that the other night where if you're going to try to maintain you're going to fail no matter what if you if your idea of succession plans is to maintain the recruiting success that Nick Saban had well by God you better hire Kirby Smart or Dan Lanning and that wasn't an option we found that out so if you're going to maintain the performance and the output of the roster you better find someone who does more with less and I think he definitely proved at Washington and his previous stops says that's exactly what he is able to do um, now obviously the the rest of the conversation that I know a lot of Georgia fans in the in the comments are asking right now is like, what's up with Downs now? Because it was reported today that he is wavering whether or not he's going to enter the portal or whether or not he's going to leave or, you know, stay at Alabama. And, look, I, I don't want to – how do I do this? If he enters the portal, we all know he's gone, right? So, if, if it comes to a portal entry, just assume that he's not staying at Alabama. And you should also assume that I would imagine his landing spot has already been picked out. Okay, so that's first and foremost um, that you should know about that. I think the other thing that's very, very important, and I don't think you can do any type of conjecture about where he's leaning, what he might do. Does Georgia have a chance? Is Ohio State at play? I think all of that needs to wait until Alabama actually makes a decision at defensive coordinator. Okay, because that's going to be the the biggest, uh, you know, kind of deciding factor, I would imagine, for downs. Um, with regards to you know what he's going to do if he if, if if they play a system that he is both foreign to and dislikes he's going to the portal mm-hmm. I'm telling you that I would imagine that right now hypothetical hypothetical situation what yeah. if we get to the end of the 30 days where the trick because you're probably at like 25 now and Bama still hasn't picked a guy so I'm under the impression and you guys go to Georgia when's your ad drop in this week uh, it may yeah, ad drop ends tomorrow I think yeah. that's your deadline Unless he wants to get into the second window. The window is not the 30 days. The 30 days is bullshit. Mm-hmm. The window is whether or not he can enroll for classes this spring. Mm-hmm. Okay? So that window, and I'm pretty sure it's not tomorrow. I think it's Thursday. Mm-hmm. I, w- I was told 48 hours. Okay. 
I, I probed the question knowing the answer. Great students over here. It's about 48 hey man, hours I'm locked left. in. I'm not worried about it. It's that. about 48 hours left on this timetable here as to whether or not this is actually even plausible until March. Okay. Um, again, the 30 day, you, congrats, you can get into the portal. That's just communications. That, whether or not you enter the portal does not mean shit other than whether or not you're going to get in trouble. The, the person recruiting you illegally is going to actually get in trouble by the NCAA for tampering, which is never going to happen. So you, in, quote, unquote, entering the portal, that's a, a Hayes Fawcett tweet. That's it. That has nothing to do with the process of whether or not you're leaving the school that you're at. Um, it does, technically, but not literally. Um, literally, all of these discussions are being had right now. If you don't think these discussions are being had actively, then y'all haven't been paying attention to college football the last, what, year and a half, mm -hmm. two years, mm -hmm. where these things don't happen the day they get in the portal. These things happen the weeks before they get into the portal at every level. Um, so, you know, I, I do think the the decision, the defensive coordinator spot is very, very important. Um, I, I obviously know that the, the Travaris Robinson hire at the University of Georgia, I don't know if it – it opened. It 100% opened the door for this for this to potentially happen if he ends up, you know, entering the portal. So how does this whole code DC thing work? I like it's because it's because if he did want to call plays at Alabama, mm -hmm. so what is a role like that entail at Georgia if you are code DC? Because I mean, Schumann has been around for the longest, so you would assume that he's the guy that's calling the plays, calling the shots, and everything. Uh, yeah. So how does that work between these two guys? Of like, I don't know. Y'all ever heard that term passing game coordinator? Yeah. Yep. I firmly believe that the I now passing game coordinators everywhere, they handle passing game installs. They they do the plays that they want to, you know, run. They break down the packages, what the defense does, and they present it to the offense, and they present it to their coordinator. But the coordinator's calling the plays. You know what I mean? The guy on Saturday with the headset on, he is the coordinator. The passing game coordinator is just basically in title. Mm -hmm. I think these things were created to give guys raises, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. To be 100% honest with you. Now, at Georgia, a co-DC title, what Will Muschamp had, that I guarantee you what that was, was Schumann is the, the play caller on Saturdays. But on Monday, when they, when they break down the future opponent, Schumann's in front of the build, or in front of the room, explaining to everybody who they are, what they do, how they're going to go about, what the key to the game plan is that week. Tuesday, when they break up and linebackers go where they go, and 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 the the specialist play or the down linemen stay here and the coverage unit stays here, that's when the co DC gets in front of the room and breaks down the actual pass game defense mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, this is very similar to what Georgia has uh, with uh, Todd Hartley, but. How often is Todd Hartley standing in front of the room, drawing up X's and O's, designing install in front of the whole offense? I don't know. I don't know how often that is. I, I really do think it is entitled. Hmm. Okay. So then what made Travis Robinson not go to Alabama? Because it sounds like it's the same thing yeah. as what it would be at Bama. Which that, I think that's why. I, I think he didn't want to go to Alabama for some bump in pay and, and minuscule title when it wasn't going to be his. Otherwise, again, the dude would be at Alabama, right? Right. The if he did not, if he was not assured, this will be your defense. If he was, if he was assured, this will be your defense. You will be the defensive coordinator. You will call plays on Saturday, and the whole world will know it. If he was not told that, or if he was and turned Alabama down, it would disregard everything this dude's done for the last six years in his coaching arc. So um, I, I just don't believe some of the reporting. Not I shouldn't say that some of the reporting. I don't believe some of the reactions that were given today were, were uh, reasonable in terms of ha, 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 look at Alabama. If you want to ha, 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 look at Alabama, do so for their uh, unwillingness to bend on giving T-Rob this job, like mm. fully job, not just in title. Yeah. Hmm? So in conclusion on the down stuff, um, hmm. what does your defensive coordinator run at Alabama? What do you do? Because I'll tell you right now, I think he loved playing in Nick Saban's defensive system. I think he loved the idea that they were a split field, split coverage defense, and that he got to stand in the back and help on both sides. Okay, I don't know if a lot of people noticed this, but I did because I watched film um, and a lot of it, right, a lot of Alabama defensive film this year because I was really intrigued by how elite their back end was. Um, and if you watch, just watch number two, okay, watch the all 22 of number two. What you'll see is him standing on one side of the field, because again, they're a split safety defense, okay? 
And he would look on his side of the field and he would give the calls and let everybody know on his side of the field what was happening. And then, as a true freshman, he would look over on the other side of the field and he would give them their calls with, what, four other NFL football players mm -hmm. on the field? Yeah. yeah. The true freshman. The true freshman was the one that was given the keys, right? We found out in spring ball last year that it wasn't just, oh, they're, they're training him at safety as a true – no. They trained him at safety. They trained him at star. He was the willy on, on dime packages. This dude did everything as a true freshman, and he was inundated, obviously, by the output and the performance, by the schematics that were that defense – and I think that's why, again, that's why to me it was very, very important. If Alabama is indeed doing absolutely everything they can to keep uh, Caleb Downs, the decision to not allow Travaris Robinson to do whatever he wanted with the defense might have been a, a, a critical misstep mm -hmm. in the ability to retain him. Now, if they do retain him, it's, it's a tremendous job, and I think it says a lot about Caleb Downs more, th more so than anything else about, you know, that dude's willingness to stick it out where he was planning. I, th I think that – I think there's an interesting perspective that you could take because I think the easy thing to do is just like, oh, of course Caleb Down should leave because Nick Saban isn't there. Obviously, there's probably going to be a step down to what Alabama was. But I think there's also a lot of – there's a lot of advantages for Caleb to stay at Alabama in the sense of like one, you're going to be gone in two years. You ain't. It's not like you got to spend yeah. your the rest of months. your yeah, eighteen months. Like that's all you got left because we know that you're going to be gone after three years. Two, you're going to be the focal point of that defense. People are going to talk about Caleb Downs wherever he plays, regardless of wherever he plays. No matter what that team looks like, it's going to be look at how good Caleb Downs is. You're going to be a highlight and you're going to be in a spotlight. And you could even argue you'll be more of a spotlight if you stay at Alabama than if you were to go to anywhere else. So I think there are some advantages of him staying at, um, at Alabama. But, of course, none of that actually matters if you're in a system that you don't like and you don't think benefits yourself. My notes right here say I think he has a couple options. One, stay at Alabama and become a god. Because he would. Yeah. Two, transfer to Georgia and become a god. Because he would. Um, or go play at Ohio State which I don't think is an option anymore. I, 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 it, it could be. At a high school, it very much so was. Um, if he goes into the portal, I would be very, very surprised if it ends up being Ohio State. Mm. Um, just because, granted, they have a bunch coming back, um, but the questions around you know Knowles' future, whether or not he's going to take a job somewhere else, things like that are still very much so up in the air. So the, the downs stuff is very, very interesting. I could very well see him just sticking it out at Alabama, like you said. Um, either way, it's going to be quiet. I don't think there's some massive announcement. I think there's a, hey, he's in the portal, and then the next day it's, hey, he's going somewhere, mm -hmm. if that's the case. Again, I very much could so or very much so could see him sticking it at Alabama because they're the one uh, – from everything I've heard out of that building, out of any player or any player in that building at all, he is the most important thing. If they can retain him, they feel that they have a good opportunity to retain a bunch of others. I believe it. Hypothetically speaking, if yeah. he were to come to Georgia, where does he fit in that defense? Oh, right next to Malachi Starks. Okay. Yeah, right next to Malachi so he, Starks. So he doesn't play star at all, do no, you don't think? Not unless he wants to. But no, I think, you know, you get into a discussion of – uh, maybe playing the star and dime, which there's technically two stars on the field in dime. There's a guy covering the number three receiver, and there's a guy standing in the box. Um, but no, you if he comes to Georgia, it's the greatest safety tandem college football's ever seen. Yeah, that'd be and insane. And it's not. I, I hate doing this. Not even close. But it won't be close. Even better than like what Miami had in the early two thousands. Did they have Ed Reed and uh, Sean Taylor on the field at the same time? I believe for so. one season. Okay, yeah. then maybe not that. Yeah. But we have ver we very much so have hindsight with those two. Yeah, okay, we, we do. Knew. I mean, Malachi That's, Starks and, and Caleb Downs could turn into what those dudes turned into oh, in the absolutely. league. I yeah. I, I got asked today about an evaluation on, on Caleb Downs. Caleb Downs is the best football player I've ever seen. Like, in person, watching him, like, play a game, not work out, not uh, go through the 40s or do the ball skills stuff, not go to, to Oliver. I'm talking about put the pads on, play on a Friday night. Who is the most impactful, best football player you've ever watched? It's Caleb Downs. Okay, the they had good football players on that Mill Creek team. They did, but they had no business beating that Carrollton team the way that they did. They had no business beating a lot of the teams that they did uh, in years past 
and uh, they managed to do so because Caleb Downs was on the field. He, he is. He's the best football player I've evaluated on the high school level with the fewest amount of question marks um, at all. There was just no, is this going to work? Is that going to translate? No, it was none of that. It was every bit of the evaluation was a check. Hmm. So, um, it, yeah, either way, he's only about – you're only going to see him for about 20 more months, and then it's on to the Sunday league which is, is good for him. Now, let's go back um, because I know a lot of people were waiting around for that uh, and we got to get back to the actual show notes. Speaking of which, pick three. We've already got our football weather, so we're down to Vickis and we're down to Peacock. Which do you want? Hmm. Peacock. Let's talk some Peacock. Look, here's the deal. I'm, I'm good. I'm good with streaming. All right? I am good with it because I am a Brooklyn Nine-Nine fan. I'm a Parks and Recs fan. I'm an Office fan. So guess who had Peacock already? This guy, all right? I wasn't worried about it. Guess who's got Hulu Live? Probably this guy. Guess who's got Netflix? Probably this guy, all right? Probably. I think everybody's got most of them nowadays, all right? No one's really, really complaining all that much. And if you were, I'm fine with you. I'm all, I'm all good with you. And in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of lenient and okay with the NFL forcing my hand on it. Here's what I'm not okay with, and I know this is not an NFL show, and I know this is a college football show, but it's coming. It's a matter of fact, it's already here. They did it with a, a, a Notre Dame and Ohio State game this year, uh, two separate games, but they did it with both of them, right? Streaming only is coming to your favorite sport, college football. And here's what I'm going to allow. A, I'm going to allow it to happen, but here's what I'm not going to allow. I am not going to sit here. All right, and allow the NFL or allow Peacock or allow Mike Tarico's goofy looking ass to tell me every single time they do something like this that I was a part of history. Ooh, congratulations on this historic event for the NFL. We strong armed all you dummies into buying a subscription service. I will be uh, compliant. I will, but what I will not be is peed on after being compliant. And that's basically what the NFL did to us this week, and it made me kind of frustrated. Because last night during that NFL game, I had to listen to Mike Tirico come on daggum television and tell me that we were a part of history and congratulate me on them duping everybody out of nine ninety nine. And I felt that was a little bit rubbing in your faces. Yeah, I did not enjoy the comments of like, oh, the, the, um, the playoff game broke the record for the most viewed streamed live event in television history. Well, like, no, duh. Everybody knows the NFL is king, and everybody was going to watch that game. We just had to do it, and that we had no other option. So, I mean, they've already started doing it where um, each SEC team has to play on ESPN Plus once a year. They did it with Georgia in the opener last year, so, like, you already have to find your way to do that. Um, it's just annoying. It's inconvenient. I get it, but also, like, if you don't want to buy the streaming service, you can find other ways to watch. Yeah, the I've been game. watching games on streaming since I went to college. This, so is this what, didn't really bother me. It's what pissed me off is that so I, we my family has the Peacock subscription, and we could think we get it with our TV deal or whatever. So I'm watching the game, and then my dad says, "Are you watching the playoff game? Because I can't watch it now." Well, of course I got to get off of Peacock so that my dad can watch They're it because he's multiple the one. Users? I guess not. I don't know. He said there was too many users. So I'm like, okay, well, you're the one paying the bills. Like, I'm not going to be the the douchebag here and be like, no, I had it first. So then I had to find another way to watch it. But it's just annoying. It's inconvenient. So I know we, we kind of st steer young in the age demographics. Not as young as I thought sometimes, but we steer young in the age demographics. So I know there's a lot of Stream East folks out there. All yep. right. Do not, do not, do not upload or uh, update your computer to Windows 11. All right, mm -hmm. Windows 11 has a new built-in system that will automatically black out streams um, that are illegally streamed. Somehow, some way, Dana White done paid Windows millions to make sure his UFC company don't get stole off of. MacBook. Huh? MacBook. MacBook. Shouts out. Um, but, yeah, not nah, the, uh, the Caleb Downs stuff will be interesting. Um, but if it does happen, if anything happens, it's going to happen within the next 24 to 48 hours. What do you think about this fish hire? You know, I'm perplexed, Jonathan, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, I also want to ask you to make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, rate, review. We've got a lot of people in here watching tonight. Make sure you're hitting that subscribe button. Make sure you're hitting that thumbs up button. And make sure you are leaving a comment in that uh, comment section and in that live chat. Jedfish. Jedfish took over a winless Arizona football program. Mm -hmm. Zero wins. And all he needed – to become a 10-win football program and beat Oklahoma with some fire-ass beats from Bill Norton. That's it. <laughs> That's all my boy needed. That locker room was a little dry. That's all it was. They needed some <laughs> from DJ Bill Norton. 
Um, but no, nah, all jokes aside, I was really confused. I don't understand this one. I get it from Washington's perspective. Mm -hmm. I think it's a home run hire from Washington's perspective. Mm -hmm. They got the best unavailable coach, right? We didn't even know he was completely available yeah. or seeking job opportunities, and he ends up at Washington. Um, but from Jed Fish's perspective, this makes zero sense to me unless you're completely comfortable dipping out of Washington within the next 12 to 24 months. This guy was like three weeks from being the number one candidate at Michigan. Hmm. Like, seriously. I think he was at least interviewed. Like, Sharon Moore is probably going to get that job. We'll talk about that here in a second. Um, but I think Jed Fish was going to get an interview for that job. I think Jed Fish was going to be the replacement for Billy Napier if Billy Napier gets fired next year, which, by the way, is his alma mater. Like, that's where he went to school. It makes no sense from a timing perspective. If I'm being Agent Brooks here, this is a dud. This, this makes zero sense. The only thing I can think of is that you saw what Washington did this year. Mm -hmm. You saw where you see where Washington's going to be. They're going to be in the Big Ten. They're going to get more revenue than anything. They're going to have more opportunities. Go ahead and pull the trigger now, and then if you have success at Washington, you are now the number one name. And not to mention, maybe he's waiting around for, like you said, that Florida job or another job where it's that's the job I want. That's that's the big job. I just don't understand why you work so hard to turn around a literally a winless, it's zero wins, yeah. a winless program. And Washington did great this year, but Washington is down to the studs. Yeah, they are yeah. down to the studs in a rebuild right now. New quarterback, three wide receivers. You even get going. Will Rogers. Yeah, I mean they even lost their backups or their 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 future transfer. So they're they're cooked from a from a we're going to compete immediately. Look at our roster standpoint. Now, obviously, Jed Fish didn't care about that when he took the Arizona job, but we we're also like twenty four months removed from people making fun of Jed Fish for being hired. All right. I don't think it was like nationally approved and nationally loved that Jed Fish was hired at Arizona. In fact, I think a lot of people were like, who? who well, Jed, who's Jed Fish? That's an interesting name. And spelt with a C-H. And the mm -hmm. next thing you know, he's 10 wins, and now he's at Washington. I think it could have been another 8, 9, 10-win season, and then he's at like a legitimate top 5, top 10 school. This was the weird thing for me. We have a top – what could be potentially one day a top 10 college football coach at a top – 20, 25 job. Yeah. That's weird to me. The, I mean, I think the best explanation of it is get paid when you can as soon as you can. Mm. I mean, if we look at what Matt Campbell went through a couple years ago, he was the exact same position. Wow, Matt Campbell's got this Iowa State team. They're, they're place preseason playoff hype. Like, he's the top name in college football right now, and he's still at Iowa State, and no one really wants him anymore just because of how it's ended up. So, I mean, maybe there's that fear of Jed Fish where you look at the wall, you look at your program, you look at it and say, okay, we're going to be in the Big 12 next year. We don't necessarily have a great roster. Odds are of us having the success that we had last season isn't great. Why not go to another bigger job, get paid, get a raise, where you can have more access to more resources? So I think that might be what his move was here. My dumbass was sitting there thinking, why is he looking at the wall? And it's because the writing's on there. Yeah. yeah. My man said he was looking at the wall. I'm like, why are you looking oh, at the wall? The wall, the writing's there. The writing's on the wall. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I, Estelle, again, do you get it? Does it make sense to you? Is the higher? Is this a good decision for Jed Fish? I'm in agreement with Christian of like, if you can get paid, go ahead and take advantage of that because you, you, you never know what could happen in the next year or two. Things can go downhill so quickly, but they can also go uphill very quickly. Mm -hmm. You can continue to elevate your status and you can continue to get your name in higher positions. Um, but I also don't know if it's the best move. Like, I feel like this may have been a premature, like, jump the gun type of deal because knowing what Washington is going to become, I mean, heck. And it's not like this has been like continued, like um, consistent success at Washington, where there's kind of built some stability there. I mean, we know that this took multiple seasons, and um, so I just don't know if this is the best hire for him in that instance. Seven years, seven point seven five million per year, more than doubles his previous contract. There you go, at Arizona. I mean, if think think about say say in three years from now, what college football looks like. Kalen DeBoer succeeding in Alabama isn't a guarantee. Billy Napier staying at Florida isn't a guarantee. There's a lot of big marquee jobs that could open up. And if you go sure. to Washington and have success, mm -hmm. you have two 10-win seasons, you're the number one guy anywhere. You mm -hmm. can go pretty much wherever you want that's open. So I think that might be his and move here. And 12, Cause, I mean, maybe if, 13. Yeah, because if, if you stay at Arizona and you have, again, eight, nine, 10 win seasons, you're consistently turning out good seasons, you're not going to be as, as sexy of a hire. Did we opinion. get any numbers on that Sarkeesian contract extension? Uh, I think I didn't see I, any. Yeah, but I'm sure you could find them if you want to. I mean, they're state I, employees. 
because here, here's what we're getting, we're getting into, right? Saban had that unwritten rule in his contract yeah. where it, once everybody gets a raise, I get a raise. Mm-hmm. We're at the point now where Josh Brooks has got to do that at Georgia, right? Yeah. Yeah. So are we, are, are we just going to get unknown bumps? Now, at the Georgia space, uh, some of my direct competitors will be out here public request records in that some bitch so goddamn quick that they'll have his salary posted on the uh, you know front pages of the news very soon the moment he gets a, an extension or a contract bump. But you would imagine Kirby's gotten a pay raise this offseason, right? For sure. And it'll just remain unspoken. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there's probably incentives to it. Till you go undefeated for the third straight season, mm-hmm. like there's going to be some incentive to that. Hmm. Do you think that there's anybody in college football so far that's kicking themselves for maybe taking a job too quickly and then like something else opened up? They were like, Ooh. dang, maybe I should have waited out a little longer. I, I think it's some uh, whoever wanted the Michigan job, not named Sharon Moore when that thing comes open. But I feel like everyone kind of knew that that one's going to happen. And we're going to talk about Jim Harbaugh eventually. But I think we kind of knew that that job was going to come open. Mm-hmm. But no, I don't, from a, a coaching standpoint, I don't know of a guy that jumped on one a little bit too quickly. Yeah. Um, except for fish, I, I don't. This like, this again. This doesn't make sense to me. Um, why why couldn't Arizona be what Washington is in a couple of years? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, if you're just telling me it's all about double the money, I would imagine he could have gotten seventy percent of that hundred percent pay raise from Arizona, right? If he strong armed them. Yeah, but again, I mean, look at what Washington's been over the last ten years historically to what Arizona Correct. has. I mean, Washington's a much better program. That's you're talking about point. you're talking about a team that's been in the playoff twice, was in the national championship this year. Meanwhile, Arizona, how many winning seasons have they had in the last ten years? I don't know. Can't I can't imagine. Many. I can't imagine it's more than six. Can you name an Arizona football player other than Rob Gronkowski? Oh, the I've got one. The, I know one of that, the, in the last that ten that years. Ron Veal shouts out. Yeah, the Scooby you Wright know who kid. Ron Veal is the Scooby Wright kid. Wasn't that his name? Scoo- yeah. I, the um, linebacker. Badass linebacker. Yeah, yeah. That dude was a dog at Arizona. That's like Tribal the only, cat. Yeah, that's the yeah. that's like the only one I can recall. That dude over drank natty lights. For <laughs> sure. For sure. Um chased he chases Jack Daniels with natty lights. Ain't no mm. doubt. Um that kind of savagery Oof. going on right there. Um where are we at? Let's go to Bama still don't have a DC. We talked about that already. Uh, J.J. McCarthy going to call somebody their goddamn job. Somebody's getting fired over J.J. McCarthy's ass. I'm going to tell you that right now. I sent some uh, text messages out to a few of my NFL folks today um, just asking, hey, what's that J.J. McCarthy stock looking like? Um, and I got, you know, various responses. I got some, oh, he's really talented. That's a great answer. I love that one. Um, he's really talented. I got some, you watch, he's going to sneak into the first round because somebody's going to fall for it. I can't wait. I, you know, look, man, he is supremely talented. He's six foot four. He's two hundred twenty five pounds. He's really, really gifted. He's a great thrower. He's a great athlete. He does all the things, quote unquote, right. His head coach at Michigan thought he was a combination between Josh uh, Allen and Patrick Mahomes, mixed with a little Tom Brady. So how could you not love all that? But here's my problem with this, and here's why I think someone's going to lose their job. Here's why I also think. If he doesn't go to the right place, he's going to be set up for failure on the NFL level. Go go watch a Michigan football game and count on two hands how many times you watch J.J. McCarthy take a standard three-step or five-step or seven-step drop. Please, I dare you. Every single time this dude has thrown the football, not every single time, 85 to 90% of this dude's passing attempts over his career, all right, have been play action, roll out, or some type of quick game. You know what doesn't live and survive on Sundays? Play action, roll out, or quick game. You can live off some play action. You can. Okay, there's some offenses that are predicated off of it. But most of quarterback play on Sundays is derived from can you take a three-step drop, stand in the pocket, process what the defense is doing, and rip a football. He has very, very limited opportunities and very limited reps at practicing that skill set at Michigan for the last three and a half years. He's got 20, he's 27 and one as a starter. And I think there might be a hundred career reps of like, all right, he's in a three step. Ooh, there's the primary read. That guy's closed. All right, let's get to a secondary read. Oh shit. Right guard's getting beat. All right, now let's step up. Let's read through the pocket. Here comes number three right across my face. Rip a dart. You know what I just described? I just described about 20 plays every single Sunday for NFL quarterbacks. 
And this guy doesn't have much of it. So I'm not saying he's not talented. I'm saying somebody's going to lose their job. Somebody's going to lose their job because they think J.J. McCarthy's this, all right, and some executive's going to buy into the, I do uh, nose ex or nose breathing exercises, I walk around barefoot pregame coach, and I'm the man, all right, and I sit by the goalposts, and I, and I do my thought exercises, and I'm mentally sharper than anybody else who's ever played the game, so says Holly Rowe, please draft me first round. You're going to lose your job. The weirdest thing about J.J. McCarthy to me is – and the sample size is so small, not to say he can't do it. I mean, he might be able to, all, everything that you just said. But it's almost like the Michigan coaches never trusted him to do that. Yeah. I mean, going back to the what? They ran the ball 27 times in a row against Penn State. And that was a look at this, ass uh, are asserting our will against this Penn State team. Look how strong we are. It also is like, there's multiple. I didn't watch a ton of Michigan games this year. I watched probably six or seven. But every time I felt like I was like, why are they kind of avoiding throwing the ball? It felt very much like Michigan just wanted to run the ball, not only because, not even just because they could or they they were asserting their will or being bully ball, but almost like they were avoiding using JJ McCarthy. Hmm. That was that was my my viewpoint on that. This draft class, <clears throat> this quarterback draft class in general would scare the ever living crap out of me if I was a GM. I like we were kind of talking about it on the way here. Like I honestly don't know if there's a single prospect right now where I'm like. That's it. That's that's one of them. Like you, you look at him right now, and you can say for without a doubt, like he could be a starter for us this next season, and we think he could have success. Caleb Williams, we know the talent is there. Drake May, like those are the only two that you can firmly say right now. Like I would feel comfortable drafting those guys. The other ones is kind of like maybe fifty fifty. Maybe it's a crapshoot, is what this year feels like to me. Somebody's gonna do it though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone is going to do it. Somebody's gonna lose their job. That's a shame, man. Um. But I, I think your point about how talented he is and how they never – we harped on it all year. They never called games like this dude was elite. Mm -hmm. You know, his, I guarantee if you look through his highlights, you know what most of his, like, great throws are? Him scrambling to the right and throwing a 10-yard comeback on the sticks. Yeah. That's what I felt like they did. That's what their whole offense felt like sometimes on third and long. Hey, just roll him right, see if he can throw a seed. Just roll him right, see if he can throw a seed. And every single time, he ended up completing that ball, I felt like, during his career. Um, but this decision, this announcement that J.J. McCarthy is going to the NFL, does this all but confirm what we all believe, which is that Jim Harbaugh is going to the NFL as well? I don't know, man. Because and, and this year, more so than ever, it feels that way. It certainly feels that way. But I feel like since 2019, there's been, hey, you know, Harbaugh's kind of flirting with going to the NFL. He's interviewed with this job, or there's rumors that he's interviewing with this job, or this spot would be a perfect place for him. He loves the NFL. And, I mean, obviously with all the scandals that have come up and, and the fact that he won a national title this year, he, it, it makes sense for him to leave, but I'm just not convinced it's an absolute done deal. I don't know. I just feel like it's the type of job that he's already interviewed for, which, by the way, I love that the NFL just tells you that they've completed an interview with yeah, a the coach. the NFL's team accounts. That too. is freaking dope. I love that. It's so transparent with it. Like, you know when it happens. They give you an update on it. That's awesome. Anyways, I think the fact that it is with the Los Angeles Chargers, like, I think that plays a role in like, okay, that feels a little different than maybe just any type of NFL interview that you might take because you feel like you have to take the interview. The fact that it is the Chargers, and then also, like, if J.J. McCarthy was going to come back, it seems like it would have to be because Jim Harbaugh is also coming back. Now, he may still come back. It may have just been like J.J. was like, I can't keep waiting around to see what happens with you. I have to make my own decision. The deadline was literally today. Yeah, so – um. But it certainly feels like Harbaugh will not be the head coach next year. Here's one thing I got to thinking about today. And, you know, he he took the interview with the Chargers. It's been reported that Vegas has an interest in him too. Oh, so he'll probably take that interview, oh. um, I would imagine. Unless before that happens, he's announced as the head coach. You, you got a smile on your face. I, right just, your face. I just don't want Jim Harbaugh to be You don't want Jim coach. Harbaugh? I would. Hey, he's great on both levels. You know, that automatically yeah. I would take Jim Harbaugh. Coach, right? I would take Jim would Harbaugh take Jim with Harbaugh. the Falcons right now. Let him be the Falcons coach. Bro, that's 11 wins off rip. The reason why you off shouldn't rip. is because apparently there's rumors that the Raiders are willing to draft J.J. McCarthy to make sure that they get Jim Harbaugh. <laughs> that's that's crazy. <laughs> you know what's that's crazy to think crazy. about? 75% of the coaches from this year's playoff are no longer with their team. That's what I was about to talk about. Um, you talking about college football playoff? Yeah. Yeah, three of the four? Yeah. Um, one retirement, DeBoer left. Um, who am I missing? Florida. If, if if Harbaugh leaves. Okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. Um, here's what I got to think about today. There's no way that Jim Harbaugh thought the NFL coaching market was going to be this, like, 
filled with quality candidates. There's a lot of them. He had to yeah. have thought earlier in the year that I was I'm gonna be the bell of the ball. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get whatever I want. I'm gonna be able to get player personnel. I'm gonna be able to get you know fifteen million dollars a year. I'm gonna get what you know promises that I'm gonna they're gonna trade up. I'm gonna get everything that I want because I'm gonna be the guy. And now all of a sudden, Bill Belichick's available. Yeah. Mike Vrabel's available. Yeah. Ben what? Johnson, the Lions OC, is obviously going to get a head coaching job. Dan Quinn back again for another head coaching opportunity, it sounds like as well. So um, I think the the coaching class got way thicker than he could have yeah. imagined. I mean, shoot, Mike Tomlin might be in that list here soon. I mean, it, Dude, ain't no way. I, I, I don't think that it's possible, but I mean, there has been discussions of like, is it maybe time? If, and if, if Mike Tomlin gets fired, people have lost their goddamn mind. <laughs> their minds, man. People are going crazy if that happens. Yeah, I mean, but again, that that kind of, the fact that this coaching market has gotten so, I don't want to say saturated, but, but yeah, in, inflated kind of makes you think like, I mean, there's a chance he comes back to Michigan. Cam Ward to Miami. Thoughts. Weird. What Very weird. Is this the weirdest transfer recruitment of all time? Yeah, I, I think this Cam Ward and DJU stuff kind of tipped us off to the future of these quarterback decisions where draft eligible guys will both declare for the draft while simultaneously seeing how much NIL money that they can scrum scrummage up and hold people leverage to. I think the one question I have for you is which was shorter, the NFL draft prep of Cam Ward or the starting, you know, career of Ja'Curry Brown down there in Miami. Oh, wow. You don't even know who Ja'Curry Brown is, so it's got to be that one. <laughs> Ja'Curry Brown's <laughs> – <Ja'Curry, laughs> that's not funny. It's not funny. Um, Ja'Curry Brown was a four-star quarterback out of Lyons mm -hmm. High School that signed at Miami. He started the bowl game for them. Had they not landed a transfer quarterback, he would have been who they were going to start to start the year next year. And I I like Ja'Curry. I like Ja'Curry coming out of high school. Not from a – like, I think this guy's going to be a great prospect. Just from a great kid. Thought he was a great kid. Didn't think it was going to work out at the quarterback position. And I don't think they think it's going to work out at the quarterback position either because they just paid, what, a fifth-round signing bonus for Cam Brown or yeah. Cam Ward? I just – what happened here that made him go, no, Miami's the spot to be? Because, I mean, I, originally it was he's a shoe in for Ohio State. Mm. He's going to Ohio State. He's going to be the next Ohio State quarterback. Ryan Day's going to be just fine. Then he went to the draft, and it was kind of like, oh, God, Ohio State's scrambling now. That's why they signed Will Howard. And now he comes back. It's very. What do you think happened in between that? Got his draft grade. Yeah, got his draft grade, and Miami saw, like, really came to grips. But did he not have a draft? About to do. Did he not have a draft grade beforehand? I mean, yeah. But I think here, here's, what, here's the whole the – whole, weighing of the options is all about last minute leverage I would imagine at that point right you have this fifth round draft grade it's not moving all right but Miami's desperate desperacy desperate desperation desperation <laughs> I was gonna let you try a little hard. me no football Miami's desperation levels were increasing by the hour right yeah. by by the offseason workout with Ja'Curry Brown they were increasing. Okay. Um, so I think that's my. So you think? Happened. So you think? I think John Ruiz got a call and said, "Hey, buddy, I need another one hundred fifty thousand dollars." Yeah. So you, so you think the the month and a half that it was yeah. in the draft went its price up a little bit? Yeah, that makes I, sense. I, and also, again, I think Miami was like, "We cannot do this." Yeah. Right. Mario Cristobal. I don't think he's in a hot seat, but it's warm. It's warm. If he if he throws another seventy five pressure pad shit ass game manager season on him on on, on the uh, on the slate, it's not gonna be great. If he doesn't kneel out a game win, <laughs> that was the shit ass game management yeah. comment right there. Is he the worst game manager that is the best recruiter in college football? There can't there cannot be a better recruiter who makes worse decisions as a coach on Saturday than Mario Cristobal. Um. I mean, if you wanted to, Will Muschamp you, <laughs> as a head coach. If maybe? you want to play devil's advocate, Dan Lanning. I yeah. mean, you could argue cost his team against Washington you this could. year in a playoff spot to be that. So, mm. but I, I don't know. I wouldn't. TBD. 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 Um, speaking of TBD, we got TTD coming up right now. Welcome in to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? What's up? 
Or shut up and grind some tape. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back in to our second hour here. It is the local hour. I got a super sub to hit right quick. Alan Berry says, you guys know anything about Kane Womack, the D.C. from South Alabama? I've heard he is the next target for Alabama. Um, so South Al obviously had a strapping defense um, this past year. Um, I don't know much about Kane Womack. I ain't going to sit here and cap tell you, my boy. Um, so, no, I don't know much about Kane Womack. Um, and I would imagine – Google, Google some Kane Womack for me and see what kind of defense he runs. Again, the bottom line, because Brooks Austin said so, is that Alabama better make that decision and make that hire based off whether or not Caleb Downs is going to fit in it. <laughs> yeah. And whether or not he's going to like it. Um, because that, that is a major contributing factor in there. But I got to tell you, man, it was really weird watching the national title this year from home. Um mm -hmm. You know, not just because Georgia wasn't playing, but there was no SEC team playing either. So there was really no dog in the fight for everybody on my timeline. And what ultimately resulted in that was that Georgia and Alabama fans found ways to bitch, moan, and complain at each other anyways. They just out here getting at each other during the national title. And they're so formal or, you know, for since then, since then and, and always, Alabama and Georgia fans finding ways to get at one another. And this Travars Robinson story that we already talked about today has been a prime example of that. I think Georgia fans have really, really relished in the fact of what went down the past couple of days, Kirby. Yeah, I mean, this is this reminds me a lot of the Scott Cochran hire a few years mm -hmm. ago mm -hmm. where Kirby hired Scott Cochran because – wasn't it because he got a bigger role there? Yeah, he, he offered him the uh, special teams coordinating job. Yeah, and so it, it, was, it was basically like, oh, my God, you know – Kirby's taking assistance from Saban. This is it. The tide's turning. You know, we're seeing we're seeing the end of Alabama. And it wasn't necessarily that. It was a big hire for Georgia. It was it's great. It meant a lot for the future. I mean, it turned into two national titles, but I don't think it was the sign of, oh, Georgia's taking assistance from Alabama now. And I don't think that's what happened here. Or it wasn't necessarily they took they did take an assistant, but it wasn't that they stopped him from taking the assistant back. What's up? Looks like it's a four two five. There you go. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, would be a schematical fit. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that, that name, Kane Womack, thrown into the chat right here, running a little 425 mint down there at UC, or USA. Um, that, that, would be, that would be ideal for Alabama in, in terms of schematical retention of Caleb Downs. Hmm. Yeah. So, shouts out to Kane Womack. And shouts out to the super sub right there, giving us a little tidbit uh, from the Alabama side. Um, we we're talking about how this wasn't necessarily Georgia stealing yeah. or, or dunking again. On, on so him. if you just tuned in, if you just heard, or if you just got here, which about a hundred of you have, because I think when we told the actual rundown of the events, there's only about 420 of you in here. So you knew hundred people, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Let's recap this again. Uh, Saturday T Rob announces leaving Alabama, coming to Georgia, co DC and uh defensive back role. Then immediately, Kalen DeBoer got him on the phone and said, hey, we want to interview for you, you for the defensive coordinator job. Uh, that interview went down. He is staying at Georgia, which has left Georgia fans to go out onto the timeline and be like, ha, 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 ha. Y'all can't even get the guy to come be your D.C. We got him to be a position coach for us. You guys suck. DeBoer out here swinging and missing. Um, Kalen DeBoering, all that good stuff. Whole bunch of tweets, whole bunch of jokes. I don't think that's necessarily the reality. I think the reality was, hey, we want to give you this promotion and title because we want to retain the players that you've got sticking around here. We might not be able to let you call plays. Uh, otherwise, I think we are all in agreement, and I think most people listening tonight are in agreement. He would be the defensive coordinator at Alabama today if it were going to be his show. If that were the interview today, it would have been his run of things, I would imagine, but that was not the case. A thousand percent, yes. Yeah, I mean, why would you not take the job if it was fitting all of your needs? Yeah, so there's that. Now, welcome in. To the local hour. All right, we still haven't had a chance to actually talk about Travis Robinson being hired as the defensive backs coach and co-DC for Georgia. So we're going to talk about what that actually means for you guys today here on this local hour. A massive, massive return announcement that we kind of reported on this show about three weeks ago um, popped up this past week, and we'll talk about that. There is a new Heisman front runner for the 2024 season, and he is a Georgia Bulldog. The players have commented about a my guy. All right. Now, I don't think we actually got to know him as a my guy, did we? I don't, I don't remember. Really I, did. 
I don't think he was a wife scout. I, I, th- I think I said it was too much of a close to a wife scout and wasn't yeah. allowed to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, but Georgia football player is already raving about a true freshman that is on campus. We'll talk about that. I learned a little bit about Brock Bowers' future in the NFL, and I want to talk to you guys about that as well. And I'm going to give you a preview of the 2025 recruiting class. I'm going to tell you right now, I went through it today. There are a bunch of in-state targets that Georgia needs to hone in on as per usual in that 2025 class. But before we get into tonight's show, I want to give a quick shout-out to our friends over at the Athletic Collection. Okay, Athletic Collection joined us this season uh, as, a, as an efforts in hopes to uh, benefit some NIL portions and revenues for some Georgia athletes. So all the posters that you see lying around this studio today can and will be made available to you over at the Athletic Collection. The link to that uh, website is in the description of all of our videos. And again, those are name, image, and likeness plays for all the athletes that you see listed and, and shown on those posters. So feel free to support a dog today by going over the athletic collection and hanging out over there. So we have one category of pick three left, and that is Vickis. Let's hear it. Vickis VapoRub? No, that's the, Vix. That's Vix. Oh, the this helmet. This is Vickis. Vickis. Okay. This is V-I-C-I-S. I thought it was Vices. Am I, am I pronouncing that I pronounce that Vickis. You would pronounce that Vices? I'm pretty sure it's Vices. Well, we calling it Vickis down here in the Vices? south. Vices? Um, and Vickis is the helmet company, Okay. I think there are three major helmet companies nowadays in the world of football based off my purviewing, right? When I go out and see all these things, maybe four, the company with the helmet and the face mask built into one is one. Um, but the three main Shut, companies, yeah. right? Um, no, Shut's, Shut's one of the ones I'm talking about. There's a whole other company that's making a whole other helmet. Um, anyways, there's Rydell, okay? They make the Revos. They make the Revo Flex. They make the Revo Speed, which is what this oh, is. Oh, right yeah, yeah. The, okay? it's Rydell that makes that one you're talking about. Yes, the one that has no top bar face mask? Yeah. That's that's Rydell as well. Yeah. But there's a whole nother one. Mm-hmm. It's beside the point. Okay. Rydell. That's a helmet company, right? Shut's got a helmet company. All right. And there's this new helmet company called Vickis. Now, Vickis has all these cool little inside technologies of the helmet. Vickis' helmet also freaking exploded on national television yesterday, which was awesome. Okay. Patrick Mahomes got hit so hard his damn helmet exploded. Now, here was my question, boys, and here's what I want to pre- uh, you know, present to the chat. Is this good marketing for Vickis or is this bad marketing for Vickis? Because here's the deal. The best and most notable player in the NFL got hit so damn hard, his helmet exploded. Now, the helmet exploded, not good for Vickis. But Spices. he got hit so hard that the helmet exploded and he didn't die. So, And, and better yet, played the next snap. So is this good marketing for Vickis to hell with you with your vices? Is this it's not me? Good it's the actual to company. hell with them. <laughs> is this good marketing for Vickis or is this bad marketing for Vickis? First off, I'm gonna go with Vickis. Vices sounds like one of those astrology things, and I'm not here with. You that. thought it was so vapor? Go that was a joke. Um. Anyways, so maybe it's kind of like car marketing, where it's like, yeah, the car exploded in the car crash because he got hit really hard, but you're alive. You're alive. You're okay. That's so dope. obviously our safety still worked. Like you're still standing. I mean, he didn't even go down. He was like, didn't stay on the ground for uh-huh. long or anything. Like he got right back up and he was like, Oh, I have a hole in my didn't helmet. He, he didn't even notice. Yeah. Didn't even no. notice. Didn't tell him. So I think it's a win. I think it's a dub for the marketing. Hmm. It's, it's, it's very different than the scenario we saw at Duke a couple years ago where Zion Williamson blew out a Nike yeah, shoe. Yeah, that's yeah. Totally that's totally different. Very different. Very different. That's, and he got hurt can't because hold of it, too. That shoe can't hold the smoke. Um, this is helmet can't hold the smoke, but he didn't die. Well, yeah. I think it's also you have to take in consideration. It was like it felt like what? Negative seven degrees there or something yeah, like that? I, think I feel like was I mean, the fact that the helmet was probably frozen solid probably had something to do with the, the stability of its structure. But I don't, I don't think it's necessarily bad, Mark. I mean, everyone's talking about it now. Hmm. I'm just trying to think, man. I mean, I don't know if this is protocol for everybody, but they had another helmet ready for him, too. Yeah. With the green dot on it. Yeah. yeah. So, like, yeah. maybe this was something that they were aware of. It's part of the possibly script. happening. Was it in the script? Uh, probably. <laughs> what wasn't in the script was my retro freshman year. Um, we traveled down to Valdosta State. It's like middle and early November Mm -hmm. it's like 28 degrees sleeting okay and I'm a red I'm red shirting it's the last regular season game of the year so I'm 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 like definitely not playing like even if coach asked the answer is no um our defensive lineman somehow some way left his helmet in Rome Georgia oh no okay so guess whose helmet he walked around with the whole game 
and yours. play mine. So I'm standing on the sideline helmetless and uh, freezing my ever-loving nads off. Because all you got, all you got is your helmet and, your, and the inside of your shoulder pads. That's it when you're out there. Um, so, yeah, Valdosta State, about 2013. Yeah, Mincy. No he did benches for y'all? Stole my helmet. Huh? No he did benches for y'all? No he did benches and no additional helmets, mm. believe it or not. That's crazy. Um, I had to steal this one. So <laughs> they, they, they were down a helmet at Shorter University when I left. Um, but nonetheless. Hey, make sure you hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, and rate, and review. And you, it looked like you had something for me over there. What no, I was just going to say, we had a kid bend the steel face mask on his helmet. Like completely came Oh, yeah. That, I've seen that one often. Which is, which is crazier to me because. I saw that in middle school. I feel like steel goes, it gives more than plastic. Yeah. That's that's the weird part. I me. think it was like carbon fiber, is what mm -hmm. the helmet exploded. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. plastic. That's not. That's this isn't plastic. Is this plastic? Heck, I don't know. It's like it's real plastic. hardened plastic. What is that? It's plastic. Is it? Yeah. That's hard plastic. Yeah, that's some really hard. plastic. That's real hard plastic. Yeah. Google what are helmets made of? Okay. Real football guys. I here. feel like it's very similar to what construction helmets are made of. No, no, those are plastic. Anyways, um. Polycarbonate for Poly the outer shell. So definitely not plastic. All right. Um, so we already hit the what's up with Downs segment. What's during. Up? You want to you talk about your my guy? Puglisi? Yeah. Yeah, let's do this. Um, you realize polycarbonate's plastic, right? Hey, look, man, we ain't got to get into the weeds. <laughs> what, a right. <laughs> what a nerd. Oh, for two tonight, Who knows man? that? I think the definition of it is really hard plastic. If it was plastic. So both right. Yeah. If it's everyday plastic, you just call it plastic. You ain't Play the call sound. It. <laughs> oh, we were practicing. Coach played in a film. Where Pugliese threw, like, I guess it's, it's hard to do this quarterback. He was running to, like, away from his throwing arm. Flicked it to him. Back corner of the end zone. Landon caught the ball. I was like, we looked at that throw. We probably watched it, like, five times. I'm not going to lie. When he came, when nice. Pugliese had his first practice, we were, like, watching. We were doing, like, seven on seven. And we're watching. He's just dicing. He's I'm slinging like, it. I mean, he's just flicking it. We're all looking like we, like, dudes behind him are forgetting to go yeah. in because we're all just like, wow, he's really <laughs> <He's actually> <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Everybody's he's just like, astonished. Like, yo, he's cold. Yeah, yeah he's he was making some throws against the starters in he's bowl good. practice. Yeah, he's nice. Artie's like just confident. Yeah, yeah, he was oh, cool. Like, I, was, I, was in his, I was in his face talking shit to him like before the play. He doesn't even phase him. Big kid? Uh, probably about 6'2, 6'3. Six, 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 mm -hmm. He's good stature. Solid, too. He's solid. Yeah. Like Carson's stature. Carson's thick. All right. Hmm? Like, come on now. Simmer down. There are certain words I just wouldn't That's say weird, describing right? a dude. You feel me? <laughs> All right, so a couple things here. Um, hey, yo. <laughs> Hey yo, um, <laughs> as as Captain Hey yo around here that walk into some sus every once in a while. Watch out now. Um, the other thing is they're not always right. They're not always one hundred percent right. Okay, they're not. But nobody knows more than players with regards to whether or not a guy's a dude. Right? You you know very early on at the quarterback position in particular. It only takes one of those. Right? Which is what they're talking about is a a, a couple of throws that he made that they're all watching on film. Warren said they sat there in the meeting room and watched it for a couple of minutes. Now, if it if it was like that, if they're stopping and watching for a couple of minutes, it must have been some some stupid shit, right? Some stuff that where you watch a play like that happen and the coach sits there and rewinds it over and over again, and then he looks at everybody in the room and he says, ladies and gentlemen, we got us one. Because that's exactly what it feels like. You saw their faces. You saw the, the, the smiles on their faces because every single one of them know that having a dude at that spot is unlike having a dude anywhere else, right? When Jalen Carter walked on campus, everybody knew that. Hmm. When George Pickens walked on campus, everybody knew that. But that does not provide unwavering confidence into a building like knowing you have a dude at the quarterback position does. That changes everything. It changes absolutely every bit of the vibe around the building. And they knew immediately, boys. They knew immediately this is a guy. Yeah, I mean, it's not even like we're halfway through spring practice or anything like that. I mean, it's freaking January. The dude's been on campus for three weeks, four weeks maybe. Like He's been around the team for not even a month at this point, and people are already talking about him like this. Uh, it provides so many advantage, advantages for you for it to be Puglisi in this situation too because you'd have to imagine that he's probably going to be doing some scout team work and stuff mm. like that. So, I mean, just having a, having him be able to come in there and have an immediate success helps everybody around. It's not just helping the offense. It helps both the defense as well. I mean, it's not even the fact that, you know, they're saying, oh, he's doing a great job. You you hear that a lot, just just 
yeah. almost political at the point of like, yeah, you know, he's mm. doing really good. He's really wild. And the fact that they came out and were telling stories, specific moments were like, yeah. he made this throw that made us all go, holy shit, that's good news if you're a Georgia fan. And I think one thing I know about, you know, Ryan is that I don't think he's ever going to try to be more than what he is. Right, I don't think he's ever going to project false confidence. I don't think he's ever going to project no. false leadership or anything like that. And I think the number one thing nowadays to get people to buy into you as a football player, particularly as a quarterback, is to just be extremely genuine. Joe Burrow has this effect. Everybody calls him Joe Cool. Yeah. I think that coolness that people don't – I think people are mistaken just general genuineness. Like he's just himself, right? He doesn't, he doesn't portray coolness. He doesn't portray confidence. He just is. Right, and that is very much so to me. What Ryan Puglisi is, I don't think he, uh, I don't think he cares about what others necessarily think or expect him to be. I think he has his own set of expectations for himself, and he just goes out and do, does those things. And I think that is a quick way to get older kids to buy into you. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not uh, going into your meeting week one and being some demonstrative, outgoing leader. It's, earn, it's earning it, right? It's like going out on the field and doing those types of things uh, and, and, and earning the, the, the respect, know, acceptance yeah. and respect of your teammates. I, th I think it's kind of – I don't want to compare it to this exactly because it's very different career paths that you have to get to to get to this point. But it's, it kind of made me think of like when you have scout team players and they're kind of starting to impress the people that are actually getting starting reps and whatnot. Like yeah. you have to earn that respect first. Like if, of course, I think it all always kind of starts out like – who the heck is this kid? Why is he trying so hard? Like, bro, you're on scout team. Like, there's no need for this. And then it turns into like, well, let me tell you a story. Then like, you start getting mentioned. Like, I remember Stetson. Like, people mm. just would kind of slide in comments of like, well, we got the Stetson Bennett dude. Like, let me th let me talk to you about this. And then it built into like, oh, now he's our starting quarterback, and we knew it two years ago. I've always said this about the University of Georgia. As an insider, I do, we rarely ever hear so and so is bad. Oh, we missed on that one. Right, unless they just drastically missed. And I don't have to name names, but like a couple of them play for Nebraska. Um, when they miss, they miss bad and they'll let you know. But nine times out of 10, we don't hear anything bad out of, out of Georgia in terms of an Intel guy, right? You only hear the good stuff, all right? And one of the quarterbacks that we heard immediately when he walked onto campus, hey, this guy, this guy throws the ball way different than the rest of them. Holy shit, wait till you see this. Carson Beck. Mm -hmm. The moment Carson Beck got on campus during the Sugar Bowl practices before the, the year against Baylor, it was like it took four, it's, it took like three days. And everybody's like, oh, oh, oh wait till y'all see this kid throw the ball. Um, that's about how long it sounded like it took with Pugli. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and that checks out, right? We we told you the whole process, this dude was a walking offer. All right, and, and when I tried to convey that to y'all, I don't know if everyone took me uh, for face value. I know Murray didn't. M Murray didn't believe me. Murray, Murray was upset about the Raiola stuff because he really, really likes Raiola. He thinks Raiola's going to be really, really special. And I think Raiola's going to be really, really good too. But th there's something about this one. that This kid right here, man, this kid is all horsepower. All right, he is all stallion. And the moment he is broken and riding like a Mustang, you're going to get a lot of results out of this one. I got a good feeling about the, the career arc of Ryan Puglisi at Georgia. Now, with that said, do you think this could possibly have negative effects moving forward? Because you hear all these great things about Ryan Puglisi. You hear how good he's doing in practice, and it might be another two, maybe three years if he gets on the field, similar to what Carson Beck is, to where the fan base starts going, all right, where is he? Why is he not starting? We're hearing all these stories. We're hearing all this intel about how good he's doing. Why yeah. is he still on the bench? Yes, yeah, so you're, you're worried about potentially like losing him to the portal or something like that? Not even losing him to the portal, but just the fan base. What you saw with Stetson Bennett and even a little bit of Carson Beck this year too where it's like, where's Brock Vandegrift? Where's Carson Beck? Why, why is the backup that we're hearing so much about on, on the tea leaves, why is he not getting any playing time? So I, I think that honestly at this point in his career, if Kirby doesn't have that going on, he's probably felt like he's failed the room. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think he learned that during Fromm's career. I think he did. Having Fromm in 2019 and 2020 not be pushed at all terrified him, I think. Yeah. Um, not only from a perspective of if this guy gets hurt, we're screwed, but also from a perspective of this guy's not maximizing his talents and his outputs. Yeah, I mean um, – so, yeah, I think to, to answer that question, that's the way I would go. It's like you constantly – I think the state of this room has to be chaotic. Mm. It has to be pressurized. 
you have to feel like you're in a bubble. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I also don't think Puglisi is ever going to shy from that. No. I, from my understanding, and I can't remember the exact way he phrased it, but he basically told me I want to play on Sunday, and if I can't play there, then I'm not playing on mm -hmm. Sunday. So mm -hmm. I just better get better. You know what I mean? If I don't earn it, I better figure out how. If that's my end, if my end goal is to play in the league, then I have to do it here. Because if I can't do it here, I can't do it there. That was his mindset, which is a tremendous mindset. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's very uh, not very eighteen year old like. Yeah. That's like twenty four, twenty five. And you know, like I, 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 it's another conversation I was having the other day. Is and we don't have to do the. We've already done the Rayola versus Puglisi thing, but there is, there is something for the fact that. Puglisi had one transfer in high school, and the transfer was from, for lack of a better term, slappy Massachusetts high school football, which was borderline seven, man, from my understanding. Going from that to, oh, hey, we, we got something. We're going to be something. I'm, I'm a football player, Dad. Let's go find out how good of a football player I am. Okay, well, how do we do that? Well, there's this place called Avon Old Farms, right? Let's transfer you up there. It's basically a football academy. It's IMG in the Northeast. Let's send you up there. Well, what do I do when I'm up there, Dad? Well, it's basically boarding school, and you'll wake up in the morning at 6 a.m., and you'll go to a lift, and then you'll go to a, a position meeting, and then you'll go to class, and then you'll come back for weights, and then you'll come back for uh, you know practice, and then you'll do post-practice rehab, and then you'll go to study hall, and then you'll go back to sleep in your dorm room. It'll basically feel like college. That's what we'll do. We'll send you to college. We'll send you to college before college, and we'll see if you're ready. And what did he do? Yeah, walk and chooch offers everywhere. And now he's at the University of Georgia. I think he's ready. I think he's uh, mature um, and physically, physically as gifted as anybody that they have in the room. All of those things lead to what you would imagine would be success at the University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. No kidding. All right. Um, before we do the Warren Brinson, actually, let's talk about Warren Brinson returning. I think Warren Brinson was the most disruptive player on Georgia's defensive front last year. That includes Michael Williams. Okay. Michael is just a better football player. <laughs> Michael is always in the right spot at the right time and never misses opportunities to capitalize on plays. And Michael also had a lot more attention drawn towards him. Okay. So that's all to be known. The other thing, uh, apparently, uh, Keely Ringo just is now starting over Garrett Bradbury, who was just benched uh, for the Eagles. So, about him? shouts out to Keely Ringo making his first career start tonight in a playoff game. Um, what were we talking about? You were talking about Warren, Warren Brinson, Brinson being, being the most disruptive. Correct. Correct. Michael's a great player. Warren Brinson, extremely disruptive. On the seven plays, he's disruptive. All right? Now, here's the issue, and here's where you got to get better, Warren, if you're listening. Okay? The seven plays, we were uber disruptive last year. I think you only made about two of them. All right, we either ran past the quarterback, ran past the ball carrier, fell on our face, did something, directed it to other people. We only finished about two of those seven plays a game, it felt like. All right, so next year, part of the deal is making sure. That's a big text. Huh. That's going to send shockwaves. Bro, you're just teasing tease. the audience. I can't, right? I can't, I can't yeah. release this because this is like something that I got in the middle of the show. Uh, that's going on Patreon immediately. Um, 2025. We're going to talk about it here in a second. 2025. Um, how about it? Um, anyways, what were we talking about? Warren Brinson. Warren Brinson. Warren Brinson. Warren Brinson. Brinson. Seven plays, only made Seven two Seven plays. Got to finish next year, baby. Hella disruptive. Warren Brinson, hella disruptive. Got to find ways to finish, okay? Absolutely, 1,000%. Got to find ways to finish next year. If he does so, gentlemen, I think you're looking at the the missing, quote-unquote, piece that George has had on this defense for a little bit, right? Um, I, I think he absolutely needs – he needs and they need 10 TFLs from him, about three and a half sacks, and if he does that, this Georgia defense looks totally different. Yeah, and you don't have to do it in the way that Jordan Davis did, where it's like, oh, my God, look at this freak of nature running 30 miles an hour down the sideline, or the way Jalen Carter did, where it seemed like he made left guards look like they got shot by a cannonball. Just be disruptive. Just get those 10 tackles for loss. You don't have to be a hero in that or be some highlight reel. If you're a solid disruptor, you're going to be great high in the NFL draft. 
I think this might be one of the key biggest returnees for Georgia this next season because it comes at a position that there are still some lingering question marks around. And you got not only Nazir Stackhouse coming back, but now you also have Warren Brinson to go alongside of that. Two big names, two big contributors, and guys that played a lot of downs last year. So if you getting those two guys back, but getting specifically Warren Brinson back, I think alleviates some of that maybe pressure that you would have felt this next year at the defense line because last year we know was a step back from what it was in years past. Mm-hmm. But getting these two guys back may help you take that step forward, maybe even two steps forward, while also having Michael play a different position, getting to try him out and do different fun things with him, while also getting extra years with Kristen Miller, getting extra years with Jordan Hall, getting extra years with these other guys that are along that defensive line that need reps. I think it could be a special unit for this um, Georgia defense next year. Yeah, I mean, you look at the only two losses Georgia's had in the last three years, the two losses to Bama. Both times, the clear, glaring fault that they had was the defensive line didn't get enough push. You didn't get enough disruption on the quarterback. You couldn't stop the run game when you absolutely needed to, and that all starts in the interior defensive line. So I think it's huge that he's returning this season. Yeah, and you know, both of those times, like at least the first one, like it wasn't an inability of Georgia not being able to get pressure against Alabama. Come to find out, we saw what they were able to mm-hmm. do against Alabama in the national championship. So I wouldn't just – I know that the game film, you know, maybe looked bad for Nazir Stackhouse and looked bad for the defensive line in that Alabama game. I don't know if you should – just label that as it, it's because they weren't able to do so or because they lacked the talent to do so I think maybe it was just again one of those things where Alabama played their best brand of football against you they made you look like fools and you played one of your worst games and so I think that maybe that it's not a big of a problem as people make it out to be getting this year stack house and Warren Brinson should be nothing but wow if we see a mass exodus real quick and brief from the YouTube audience, it's because they're all running to patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin right now to read that nug, and then they're all going to be right back. So we'll see a little ding, 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 and we're watching it right now. Ding, 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 and they'll all ding, 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 ding. They'll all come right back. I had a feeling that's what you thought you that's were, what it was? I did. I honestly yeah. did. I, honestly, it's a massive one. Um, we'll talk about the, the reaction from that tomorrow when it ultimately hits. Um, but I don't want to tease too much on that one. Uh, but if you want it, patreon.com forward slash Brooks Austin. It's right there in your inbox. Um, Carson Beck, Heisman season? Dude, I, I, all I, signs point to it. He is the odds on Vegas favorite three way tie. Three way tie between Jalen Miro and Quinn Ewers. Plus 750, all three of them. Can we? I wish you could. I wish you could short these things like you could stocks. I would short the piss out of that Jalen Miro stock. Yeah. <laughs> is he even going to be the starter? Do we even know this? No, I th- and I think. Do we even know that Jalen Miro is guaranteed to be the starter nah, for Kalen DeBoer? I, th- I think that's the most recent update is January 8th on those. So it's I mean, probably changed since then, but yeah. the, uh, the books just haven't changed. I think you could put it this way if Car- Carson Beck will win the Heisman if Georgia wants Carson Beck to win the Heisman. Ooh. I, I think that's. Tucky McTakester. Right I think there. that's how you can put it uh, hmm. because we it's not a lack of talent. He's going to have all the weapons in the world to do so. If Georgia wants their quarterback, if they want they finally get back in the Heisman running, if they want Carson Beck to win the Heisman Trophy, it's going to be because Mike Bobo, Kirby Smart, and that staff are like, we're getting Carson Beck the Heisman Trophy in 2024. So I went through the stats today. In order to win a Heisman in 2023 or 2024 at the quarterback position, you basically have to throw for about near or at 4,000 yards Check. in 13 games. Okay, 13 games? You think you can do it? Yeah. And here's the here's the kicker. And here's how – if Georgia wants him to. He's got to throw for about 40 touchdowns. Yeah. Because yeah. he ain't going to run for him, right? Yeah. All these other quarterbacks that win Heismans, they have 15 rushing touchdowns, 10 rushing touchdowns to help their total touchdown total push it north of 45 into that 50 range, which what do you is have where this you need to be. Four? Huh? What do you have, like three or four this season? Rushing touchdowns? Yeah. If that. Yeah, maybe, if that, maybe three. Maybe three. I can recall of two. Yeah. Um, Google time. So, that, that, the 4,000 total yard, or the 4,000 yards number is very much so doable. It's like 315 a game. Yeah. The, the question is whether or not he's going to put up enough touchdowns, which mm-hmm. last year, he had what, 27 touchdowns last year? Yeah, I think so. 24. 24. So, yeah, that's the, not it. It's, it's got to be the games of – Three touchdowns, four touchdowns, and you yep. sprinkle in a five touchdowns. It's got to be those types of things. So that's why it's it's just it's simply a decision. Like um, when it's almost like how when Brock like when they wanted Brock Bowers to take over a football game, you made sure Brock Bowers took over a football game because you fed him the football. Mm. If you want Carson Beck to get this type of stature, if you want Carson Beck to be the odds-on favorite to win the award when it's time to go to New York, it's going to be because Georgia decided he, they wanted him to. Now a quick caveat on this. I don't think, and I can't recall off the top of my head, any time an odds-on favorite to start this season won the Heisman. 
was Caleb Williams not the favorite two years ago? Not in 2021, no. It was Bryce Young. Uh, That's a great call. Yeah. They For some odd reason, the, the previous highs and winners are always the odds on favorite, which is, again, because Vegas says – we're going to lose the least amount of money if this guy repeats. Well, it would have been 2021, would have been 2022, but still Bryce Young. Yeah. Here's the thing I don't think we've talked about, and I don't think anybody's brought this up. In the years past, Georgia has not had an opportunity for a Heisman moment. They'll have a bunch of them next year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They two they massive road games. Three. 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 Yeah. You got to go to Austin, to Tuscaloosa, and to Oxford. Mm -hmm. Okay? If he, if he has one big game I mean, in one of those. Yeah. There's your Heisman moment. He did, there was no opportunity for that this year mm -hmm. unless he would have just thrown for 450 against Alabama in a yeah. shootout and won it. And I think even then he would have been playing from behind. But you think like – you think of Penix's year this year and if you think of Jaden Daniels' year this year, they had mass – they had games in which they were, hey, fourth quarter, one-score games, we got to go rack it up. And that's exactly what that player did. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I, I don't think you're – I don't know if you're, you're never going to see a Georgia Heisman Trophy winner, but they very clearly do not care about this yeah, stuff. No. They very clearly no. do not. Mm -mm. And I think another he won't even he won't even go out and advertise for a guy. No, go ahead. Well, I think another thing is until 2020 ish, you were a very run by committee football team. Like your quarterback threw the ball three times a game, which is not going to get you a Heisman. And then you had a running back room that was splitting between three or four guys, which is also not going to get you a Heisman. So Georgia hasn't never really had these opportunities. They've had games where you could have Heisman moments, but it's never been – they've never been so focused on one guy for offensive production that it's mattered for them to be a Heisman contender. Mm. Like even when you had Todd Gurley in 2012, you had Keith Marshall and, and all the other guys. So it's it's all you've always had a one-two punch. But Chubb in 17 got some votes, but mm -hmm. there's Sonny Michelle in the back backfield as well as uh, yeah. a freshman. Um, DeAndre, DeAndre Swift. Swift. This is at least a step in the right direction, though, if you do want to get to that point. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, even with all those great players, there was never a point in time where Georgia had the favorite, the odds on favorite. I mean, I know it's January, and these odds are going to fluctuate throughout the year until the season starts. But the fact that a Georgia player is at the top of the list is just a – I mean, a notion of things are kind of changing. Uh, Jackson Dart plus 2,000. Garrett Nussmeyer at plus 2,000. Jackson Arnold plus 1,800. Nico uh, Amaliva. At plus fifteen hundred, Will Howard at plus fifteen hundred, Dylan Gabriel at plus a thousand, and then those three guys at plus seven fifty. Here's the money, okay? Where's you the money? You ready for you ready for some money? Let's yeah. hear the money. Plus four thousand odds, Kirby. How's that sound? Does that sound like good juice? For who? Does that sound, I'm asking. Does plus it sound 4, 000, like good juice? Plus four thousand odds. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Colorado wins eight games next year. Is Shadur Sanders in New York? No. Is he in New York? Is he in New York if they win eight games next year? Is, if he, uh, that's the that's the threshold. I say Colorado wins eight games. Shadur Sanders' ass is in New York. I, I right maybe. Now. I but, put it but getting in New York doesn't get you money. I, I put it this way. I because I had the same reaction you did at first when he asked me that, and I was just like, "Well, you know what? If Colorado's going to win eight games, it's because it's going to be because Shadur put up a Heisman yeah. worthy season. Like he's going to have to put up those type of numbers for them to win eight games. If he throws for forty two hundred yards, which is not out of the no. ordinary, I, it is. It's a lot. But if they throw it forty five times a game and he throws for four hundred yards a game, and they're eight and four, I'm telling you right now, he might win a Heisman, mm. and at plus four thousand odds, I'm not hating it. Although, it, it, heck, you at that point, if he's throwing for four thousand yards, you might have Travis Hunter and Shadur in New York. Yeah, because <laughs> no. it's gonna have no. I'm, come on, no. hater, why are you hating? No, I'm not hating on. It. I'm just like no. It's there's no way because the four losses are gonna be absolute blowouts where they get skull dragged. I mean, he won three games and was the SI Sportsman of the Year. So it's it's <laughs> <laughs> got team. Uh, <laughs> you're in trouble there because you can't shit on your employer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah no, I, I'm, I, <laughs> I was like, what are we doing, man? What are we doing? Come on, Pat. You're better than that, man. Yeah, no. I, I, I wouldn't. You don't it. like the plus 4,000 odds, I'm sure? I mean, plus 4,000, why not throw $10 on it? But That's a sweet little rack, man. That'd be fun. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. All right. Let's do this 2025 class preview, shall we? Let's hear it. Let's do it. Um, all right. So you have six commits in 2025 right now. Ellis Williams, uh, who is a monster, by the way. Um, he looks like an avatar. 6'7", 230 pounds. Um, I wish, and I, I know this is going to sound bad, I, I wish he played for like 
a Colquitt mm. or somebody, I'm not going to say other than Camden, but an offense other than Camden's. Because this is one of the nation's best tight ends, and we'll never know. Like, we'll mm. never get to see it. We're just – it's all projection from him, um, which is unfortunate. Justice, Terry's, uh, Justice Terry, excuse me, the defensive lineman from Manchester, he's a grown man. He was the one that went viral a couple of years ago mm-hmm. for being a grown man at yeah. 14 years old. He's huge. Jaden Prolotti, the linebacker from uh, Buford. Ethan Barber, the tight end from Alpharetta. Tay Harris, who I think is criminally underrated at Cedartown. If you turn that film on, that looks like a four- or five-star corner. Um, and then Bo Walker, who also I think is criminally underrated at the running back position committed from Cedar Grove. So those are the six. Now, I'm going to read off some other names because I think you could get to 18, 17 in-state kids, 18 in-state, 17 in-state kids, all right, and then an 18th that I'm basically considering in-state because he's just right across the line and he's been actively recruited by Georgia for a long time. So let's go through this. Elijah Griffin, the kid from Savannah Christian, he's a must-have, must-get, was just on campus this past weekend. By the way, must-have, must-gets, defense alignments, they don't leave. All right, Georgia's hit on every single one of those guys. Go back and look at it, all right? So I think Elijah Griffin probably going to be a dog. Um, I don't even have to tell you that I'm putting in a prediction machine, whatever, because I put an SSM in, a sliding scale majiggy, back in September. A while ago, It's been a minute. It's been a minute since I've been trolling the industry with some sliding scale majiggies. <laughs> we probably going to have to bring the SSM back out. Um, so there was a sliding scale majiggy inserted for Elijah Griffin a long time ago. Zayden Walker, the linebacker out of Schley County, he's a five-star as well. Um, Isaiah Gibson, the defensive end. I know he's listed as an edge at some place. He a defensive end um, out of Warner Robins. I saw him this spring. He's a good football player. The Christian Garrett kid out of Prince Avenue, defensive tackle. He's developed into a really, really, really good high school football player. Juan Gaston, the offensive tackle out of West like I think he's an NFL football player. I think if you miss on him, it's criminal. All right. I think he's going to be a, a, a next Amarius Mims type football player out of the state of Georgia. Usmani Krama, the running back out of Lee County, an elite football player. It's going to come down to you, Alabama, Clemson, Florida State, the big ones. Okay. It's going to come down to the big ones for that one right there. Cortez Smith, the center out of Parkview. I think he's elite. He's been elite for a long time. Just had a shoulder injury about 18 months ago. Had to rehab back from that. He should be a Georgia Bulldog. This is like supposed to be the next one at the center position, okay, is a bona fide savant when it comes to the game of football at the center position. Mason Short, the offensive tackle that's currently committed to Alabama, he's from Evans, Georgia. You need to work on it. All right, I'm going to tell you that right now. You need to work on it. Just had him on campus this past wa- well, this past weekend. Thomas Blackshear, C.J. Wiley, Jonte Gilbert. These are all elite high school football players here in the state of Georgia that you are in on. Those are all, in my opinions, takes. And there's some other names, all right, that I didn't even get into, all right? And there's a national name that's just right across the state line in David Sanders that you better lock up as well. So there's 18 names right there, guys, on the surface of this class that I I could immediately circle and pin that I got to say, hey, you got to go get those guys. Those are good football players right in your back door. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Elijah Griffin one for sure. I remember going to see Juan Gaston with you the last year on the sp- in spring. Holy cow. I mean, it, it was just fun to watch him warm up, just to watch him move around the football field. The whole Westlake roster was. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, for sure. That was fun to watch, though. So. I mean, again, just Georgia loading up um, on recruits, and de- I definitely got to get the Elijah Griffin one. And just, I mean, loading up on the roster is important, of course. Stacking these classes, especially knowing that building up the depth now is even more important than it ever was, just because you're going to be playing more games. You're going to have to be relying on your depth even more than you have in years past. And your roster is going to be plucked at a higher rate nowadays than ever mm-hmm. before, no doubt. Yeah, the one who sticks out to me in particular is Justice Terry. We interview- I interviewed him in the summer when we went to that uh, Under Armour All American thing. Yep. It was very weird standing next to a 16-year-old kid when it's like, oh, this is why I'm not a D1 athlete. It's <laughs> like he towered over me. That Under Armour event provides a lot of those. Yeah. I hope you get to go this year with mm-hmm. us. Um, it's February 18th. We'll see about it. I got to – Oh, that's whole, February 18th? Yeah, it's close. It's early. It's, it's very early. Um, so we, we got to go see about doing that. Um, we also – I got some other things that evening that you guys might be handling most of our recruiting coverage for that day, so – Cool. It'll be good for you guys not to do too much show planning here. But I, I'm trying to look at these names right here. And obviously, Elijah Griffin is a, is a major must-have. I think so is Zayden Walker, right, the kid out of Schley. Um, I remember watching him against uh, – I can't remember who they played in the state title game last year. Um, very, very physical, physical football player. He looks the part of a Georgia linebacker. I would imagine they're not going to miss there. But, you know – at some point, someone's going to duck the room. 
Mm -hmm. right? And I'm not going to say they're ducking competition. I'm talking about ducking the room. And honestly, if I were a linebacker or if my son was a linebacker, we would be bringing that discussion up. It's not about not being confident in your own skill set. It's about being honest, all right? And being honest is that only two of them play, and they got about seven NFL ones in that room right about now. So somebody ain't eating, and let's hope it's not you when you get there. So if it were my kid, we'd be having those conversations. But, you know, we'd also be having the conversation of it's Glenn Schumann. Let's go play. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Let's go get developed. Yeah, I mean, you you don't really have to say – much other than look at the proof of concept that George has put in the linebacker position in the last five or six years since Kirby Smart got there. Buckus award winners, first round picks, NFL guys are getting multi million dollar contracts. So you don't have to look far to see where some of the best linebacker development in the sport of college football is. I got a question for you boys. Let's hear it. Glenn Schumann, Dante Williams, Travars Robinson, Trey Scott, Shadera Uzo Deribe. Um is that the best defensive staff Kirby Smart's ever put together from a recruiting standpoint? I can't think of a better one off the top of my head. Mm. Hind knowing the hindsight on Dan Lanning kind of holds me back a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. even then, like, I didn't even have to know the hindsight on Dan Lanning to know that he was a really good football coach. But I don't, it's it's got to be up there. But the a couple years ago, that staff was loaded as well. I mean – and then you go on the other side of the football and you got Todd Hartley, who's obviously yeah. a sniper, Jeez. right? Um, and, I mean, say what you want about B-Mac and Stacey Searles, and then there's Mike Bobo, but this defensive staff is just banger after banger. I mean, listen to some of these names, right? Vernon Hargraves, Caleb Downs, Jordan Birch, Tease Tabor, uh, Jalen Mbakwe, Des Ricks. Those were all signed by one guy, Travars Robinson. And it was signed across a plethora of positions, right? You heard some DBs in there. Mm -hmm. You heard Jordan Burch, defensive end out of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. They kept that kid in state mainly because of T-Rob. Like, <laughs> that's one guy. Scary. And then you look at Dante Williams. He's got five, five stars to his name just in the last five years. So, it's yeah. just, I mean, it's unprecedented, really. Yeah, it's, it's – when you look at why college football's teams succeed and the fact that it's recruiting, and you look at what George has done with their staff – combined with the fact that how they've recruited over the last six years, it can be really scary to think of, you know, what's coming for other teams in the future just because of how well Georgia's recruiting and how well they're going to recruit from now on. Do you think this is one of those staffs that 20 years from now you'd look back and they're like, they had who on that staff? <laughs> like who, the they had, staff. They, Yeah, but at the same time, I want to say no because th these guys aren't – don't strike me as guys that are just itching to get to that next spot that like are yeah. seeking after like these, even like Dan Lanning, who we all knew was going to go after a head coaching gig at some point. It never felt like he was just itching to get out of there, that he was just dying to like, ah, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get to that next step. All the, I mean, all these guys feel like they're content at Georgia until like something comes up. Eventually that job is going to come, but we aren't just going to continue putting our name. I don't know. I also don't think that you're going to have a lot of these like, oh my God, they had them on the staff at this point just because the Kirby Smart coaching tree is something that's starting to grow now and it's mm. it's so famous in college football. Like You basically knew every college football coach that was a former assistant of Nick Saban just because of that that coaching tree per se. Like If, if there was a head coach, it was like, oh yeah, former assistant to Saban just because it was it, that was that famous. Mm. So I think Kirby Smart's tree is going to get that way. How long did it take for Saban to get that? To get to who was who was Saban's first like big assistant that left him was like a legit head coach? Um, wasn't D'Antonio an assistant for him for a while? Maybe. There was a whole article in uh, the USA Today about this. So all the way back to 1996, his days at I guess this is Toledo, mm. uh, Dean P or Kent State, excuse me, Dean Pease was on that uh that, that staff uh pat Shermer yeah. was on his uh, staff uh brian dayball uh on his oh, obviously that's i don't know how this thing works in terms of how these things broken off in years i'm just looking at mark d'antonio was the first for sure he went was a head coach at cincinnati though mm. before he got to michigan State. Yeah. um so there's that obviously because d'antonio coached for him at michigan state i'm an idiot um <laughs> i guess dayball was on that michigan state staff as well 
Will Muschamp was probably his first big one. That's what I was going to say. I think it's yeah. got to be Muschamp. Muschamp at Florida was his first real big one. I feel yeah. like Will Muschamp was also kind of his first apprentice, where it was like he followed yeah. him around for different teams and was like, it's Will Muschamp and, Kurt, and Nick Saban are the, the one A and are the two like dynamic duos of coaching. Mm-hmm. So, I looked at that the other day. That was astonishing to me that Will Muschamp was a defensive coordinator in the SEC at like 31. It's got to be. It's got to be the longest streak, right? I, I I don't know of anybody that has stuck around in this conference for that long, holding that type of position. Yeah, I can't think of and anybody. Pretty much unbeknownst to everyone. Well, yeah. was, did he not? Not that Will Muschamp doesn't like. Get he's his yeah. Or, like he's or never plays, had to. He's never been that guy. He's never had to rebuild his whole profile. Really. Like you can kind of uh-uh. say he did that for like being an analyst at Georgia. Like that was like his rebuild. But like we all know what was going on As there. As a coordinator, he's been great at every stop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As a head coach, he had two failures. Yeah. I think that's fair to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for it's sure. Completely fair to say. I wouldn't even cla- – would you even classify South Carolina as a total failure? Like, if you go 7-5 to five at South Carolina, it's like <laughs> – Yeah, I think – You're decent. You're decent. Yeah, I wasn't a fa- – I think the problem is that – and this is a completely different topic, a completely different discussion, but South Carolina really wanted to be that second team in the East behind Georgia, especially with Tennessee down and, and Spurrier Florida down. Them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it just – it really set – like, Spurrier set really unrealistic expectations for what that program could be. Now they're out here giving the feet for free to go six and seven. Hey, Lovely. five and seven. Yeah, they, five didn't, seven they didn't make a bowl game. They didn't make a bowl this year. They didn't make a bowl game. Shouts out to Beamer. Hey, that's our show for tonight. I appreciate wait, wait, wait. you. Were you going to talk about Brock Bowers? Oh yeah, dude. I learned more about Brock Bowers this past weekend. Uh, y'all know this Puka guy? Yeah. Puka Puka Nakua. Um, y'all know about Puka? <laughs> I've heard know of, about. Puka. I've heard a thing or two um, about him. So I was watching Puka last night. And the play where he ran a post and Stafford threw it into, like, three defenders and it was just Triple Puka coverage. going up and, yes. like, manning the ball. I saw that and I was like, I've seen that before. Yeah. Not a ton of separation, just, ooh, I'm way tougher than you. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm getting that ball. Like, I saw a lot of that the last couple of years at Georgia with Brock Bowers, right? And then there were a bunch of plays from our boy Puka where Puka's just out here running through arm tackles. Just bitching defensive backs. Just like, you can't tackle me, stiff arm. Ooh, threw you out of bounds. Now I'm going to outrun that guy, all right, and then finish on contact on the safety that's trying to tackle me. I saw Bowers do that a lot in college, too. And then I realized, oh, shit, this Puka Nakua guy is like 6'2". He's like 200. He's listed at 205, but if you told me he played at 210, I wouldn't be shocked. Not, not physically imposing when you mm-hmm. see him in person? I mean, heck. But thick. There was, you can tell. There was that video at the beginning of the year where it was like, here's Cooper Cup going through the ladder drill, like warm-ups and everything, yeah. and then you go to Puka Nakua and it looks night and day different. Like you would yeah. never know that Puka Nakua was leading the league in receiving yards at that yeah, point. Just a guy. That's that's Brock Bowers to a T in warm-ups. I mean, if you, di- if you had no idea who he was, if you were going and watching Georgia football for the first time, you were standing on the, the sidelines. There with the <laughs> yeah, you'd be like, who's this? What the heck? Like, this is the guy I'm supposed to come here and watch? It's like, oh, yeah, this oh. is the guy I'm supposed to come oh. here and watch. Even his muscle mass doesn't look like like he's super muscly. You know, he's like 230 pounds, and he's strong as an ox. You can't tackle him. But he don't look like that. No. You know? he's. I, I tweeted about it. That's the player comp for me. Now, he's not going to be able to double move like Puka. Yeah. The, the quickness is probably not there. But if you told me Puka Nakua was 6'4", 225, he would look like Brock Bowers. You would play him like Brock Bowers. And I think you're going to play Brock Bowers like you play Puka, where is we're going, to, we're going to take vertical shots when we're bunched with him. We're going to op- or operate with him over the middle of the field. We're maybe going to give him some run after the catch type looks and touches. Puka Nakua, my NFL comp for Brock Bowers. How about that? I like Lovely. it. It's a good comp. All right. I got a uh, – I'm excited about this sauna. Can't even lie to you. Ooh, yeah. I'm kind of stoked. Been ice bathing. Been sauna in now. So we're just losing our mind by the minute. I like it. Let me know how it is. I will. I've been hey, interested in those. Love you guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Make sure you stick around.